Hello Wolfpack, uh, we've compiled a list here of the Market Mindset series. We've got all six episodes here in one, uh, and this is going to teach you everything you need to know about trading, uh, everything you need to know about investing without actually teaching you technical analysis. This is a two hour video here, so there's lots of content, all of which is very useful. Every single point I bring up here, I've you know, evaluated quite intensely, uh, and all of this is very relevant. If you actually want to make a consistent, profitable income, trading and investing in the cryptocurrency market or in the traditional markets, right? Because it supplies to both areas. All of this advice in this video, everything I mentioned in this video is relevant in some way, shape or form. And I highly recommend that you actually understand the psychology behind investing and the psychology behind trading before you actually try to understand technical analysis itself. Because I can tell you right now from personal experience and from the experience of everyone who I know as a trader or investor, the psychology is at least half of the work. In fact, if you don't have the right mindset, you're almost guaranteed to lose money in trading or investing in the cryptocurrency or traditional markets. Thanks for watching, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoy the video. I hope you enjoy the content. Uh, and I'll catch you in the next video. Hello, Wolfpack. Um, we're back here and I've got a, I've got a new series for you guys, um, Investing Mindset. It's an investing mindset series. And I want to be answering a few questions that I've kind of, I've jotted down in my notepad over the past couple of days. And these are really key points that I think everyone who is involved in any financial market, specifically cryptocurrency, I should know. And you probably heard these points before, but I think it's good to have a uh, compacted series in which you can kind of choose the videos you want to watch. Um, and this will be my first edition to the series. I'll release them whenever um, I feel like when, whenever something new comes into my attention. Um, and I suppose my first video uh, on, you know, this investing mindset series would be, don't be a sheep, right? Don't be a sheep. And I've got a few points and, you know, this video will be kind of an introduction to this series as well. So I'll run you through a bit of that as well. Um, I want to be just jotting down some ideas and just running through some information. Uh, just off the top of my head, you know, just give you guys a bit of an idea of what I think personally, what, it, you know, quote unquote, what it takes uh, to succeed in the financial market. Because the, the first thing I want to say, guys, is that, you know, I don't know the exact statistic, but I can tell you right now, 90% of people uh, who invest in cryptocurrency, who invest in the stock market, who invest in anything, right, outside of long-term ETFs, and even in that case, they're very risky now with all of this inflation going on and stuff like that. But 90% of the people in financial markets end up actually losing money, right? And then you wonder, well, where does that money go, right? Well, that obviously goes to the institutions and the whales and the market manipulators who are actually manipulating the market and transitioning the wealth from the poorer, less educated people to the smarter um, and more, you know, financed uh, institutions, corporations, whatever they may be, uh, manipulating the market. So people who make money in this market, 90% of the time are not actually retail investors and not the people like me and you. All right, that's that's very important to understand. And when you look into the charts, you can see this playing out very clearly, right? These random drops, just speaking of my, like, just speaking of previous price action on Bitcoin, right? The drop down from 64k to 30k in May. All right, do you think that was completely natural? I could have predicted it, yes, but do I think the extent of which uh, that accumulation zone was completely natural? No, it wasn't. All right, it, we were kept down. The price was held down there by manipulators, by whales, institutions, whatever they may be. Um, and, you know, they're trying to scare you out of your money. They're trying to scare you and make you sell at the bottom, right? So they can pick up your bags off of you because they know that this asset class is valuable, right? And I want to say that manipulation is prominent in cryptocurrency, but also in every market, some would say even more in the stock market. So in order to avoid that, in order to avoid that FOMO, avoid that, you know, jump out, panic selling, you can't be a sheep, right? And this is what is coming back into the title of this video. When everyone is screaming, when everyone is crying, when everyone is losing, you know, 30% of their net worth overnight, you can't panic, right? Because this isn't going to last forever, all right? I want to go to our first point in this video now. My first point in this video is no one is a profit, right? No one's a profit. No one's 100% right at any given time, right? Not me. I never claim to be. Not, um, you know, I can't remember the name of the guy right now, but his name's Robert Kiaski or something. 
rich man, poor man, right? The guy who's been calling for a financial market crash and hyperinflation for years and years and years, right? He just released something you would have seen it circulating Twitter saying that he thinks this October is going to be the biggest crash we've ever seen in human history, right? He's said that multiple, multiple times over the years and each time he has been wrong, right? He's been saying that since 2013. Look it up for yourself. You know, he says it every other month, right? But, you know, people listen to him because he's famous, right? People listen to him because he's famous. It's the same thing with people and, uh, you know, apologies if you listen to any of his channels. I've got nothing wrong with them, but people like BitBoy Crypto, for example. It doesn't matter how much he is wrong. People will listen to him because he's famous, because he has a reputation, right? People forget things very quickly. If I'm wrong about something, I guarantee you, you, you guys won't remember it within a couple of weeks, right? And that's why people get the perception that these people who are famous know everything in the market just because they have a platform. Just because someone has a platform, it doesn't mean they are particularly educated on the market. Obviously, they need to be educated to some extent, otherwise they wouldn't talk about it. But it doesn't mean they're, you know, some trading mastermind, right? And just because someone shows you that they have money and they're making money consistently in crypto, that doesn't mean they're a trading mastermind either, right? We're in a bull run. Everyone makes money in a bull run, right? It's, it's about whether you keep the money or not. That is actually important. So no one is a prophet. And this is why you can't rely on anyone, right? You can't be taking, I see people like looking at my trading ideas that I post to Telegram, right? For example, this is me, right? My trading ideas, you know, objectively go pretty well, okay? But you shouldn't be taking it at face value, you know? And this isn't just me protecting myself and saying, do your own research for legal reasons. This is me genuinely trying to help people, all right? Do your own research. There's the reason why people say that. If you're not educated enough on the financial market to do your own research and come to your own decision, come up with, you know, uh, counteractive points, uh, counterpoints, whatever it may be, you know, then you probably shouldn't be making the trade because you're just gambling, right? Who do you know? You know, which one of you guys out there watching this video who follows my trading schools, do you know who I am personally? Do you know where I studied? Do you know how old I am? How many kids I have? You know? You don't know anything about me, you know? I'm just some dude on the internet, right? Don't take what I say at face value, right? Yes, you know, you can you can kind of understand that some people have track records like myself, you know, like I have a track record. You can kind of understand that, you know, I'd say, you know, not, not to boast myself, but most of the time I am correct. That doesn't mean I'm going to be correct all the time. There's certainly times I can tell you there's many, many, many times, not only on a monthly basis, not only on a weekly basis, but on a daily basis, that I'm incorrect about where I think the market is going, right? But what, it, what it's actually about is it, it's about being right more than you're wrong. But the point is, no one is right 100% of the time, literally no one. So if you're placing your money, your hard-earned cash, on a trade that you've gotten from a Twitter post or a Telegram post without doing your own research, you are literally just gambling. You may as well go to the casino, right? That's my first point. No one's a profit. Be independent. Think for yourself, right? Make your own ideas. If you're not educated enough to come up with counterpoints for a trading signal, to actually look at the charts for yourself and make a decision, you shouldn't be trading in the first place. All right, my second point. Nothing is certain, right? Think in probabilities. Nothing is certain. This goes back to what I was saying. I can tell you, you know, I, I, I strongly believe, I strongly, strongly believe that Bitcoin will be going to new all-time highs in Q4, right? I have to say I'm probably... 85 to 90 percent sure that bitcoin will be going to new all-time highs in q4 but nothing is certain right nothing is 100 percent because there's always the chance that something will happen out of the ordinary now this goes against you know what we're taught as investors and as traders you know and the, the general saying is the trend is your friend until it ends right so you should be investing with the trend until it ends. Don't bet on anomalies, right? Don't bet on something abnormal to happen, right? Because most of the time it doesn't happen. People have been calling for a super cycle on Bitcoin since the first cycle on Bitcoin. And it's not happened yet, right? We haven't seen a super cycle yet, right? You shouldn't be betting on the thing that is least probable to happen, right? Just because you think something is going to happen, it doesn't mean it's going to happen this time. For example, 2017, 2018. Cryptocurrency went from a few hundred million, I think it was, sorry, a few billion in market cap to, you know, m you know, it, it, it went massively, massively up in the sky from something that was completely abstract that only nerds and, you know, <laughs> I guess you could say computer programmers owned and drug dealers to something that 
a lot of people, everyone knows someone who owned a cryptocurrency in 2017, 2018. It was on every major news outlet. People were calling for the, you know, people were calling for uh, 2017, 2018. That was going to be the adoption of Bitcoin. It's going to happen right there. The US government was going to adopt Bitcoin, right? Super cycle right there, 2017, 2018 didn't happen. No matter no matter how much people thought it was going to happen, no matter how much evidence there was for it happening, it didn't happen. Don't bet on something, you know, that is less likely. Don't bet against the trend, right? That's that's what I was saying before. The trend is your friend until it ends. Okay, but nothing is certain, right? Nothing is certain in the sense that, you know, I think that Bitcoin's going to go to 100k, but, you know, on the off chance that Evergrande, you know, the big the big name we've been hearing about for a couple of weeks now, on the off chance that actually does collapse and it actually does bring, uh, you know, housing crisis in China and the US, you know, will Bitcoin actually go to 100K? But would we bet on that? You know, what's, what's, more, what's more probable here? Are we going to bet on, you know, a massive institution collapsing that is potentially going to be supported by the Chinese government who's going to be avoiding that housing crisis? Or are we going to bet on a decade worth of cyclical theory that has been followed to the T every single time failing, right? I would say that it is more likely that Bitcoin goes to 100k. But I will say again, nothing is certain. And this is why we have stop losses, right? This is why we have uh, measures that the exchanges give us to protect our wealth, right? If something goes wrong, you set a stop loss. And while you're sleeping, you don't lose 30% of your net worth overnight as the global markets crash, right? There are things that you need to be doing to protect yourself in this market. You can't be going, for example, Never go all in in one coin, right? Very simple, very basic rule. You've probably heard it a thousand times. Diversify, right? Diversify. You shouldn't be all in in one coin because what happens if that coin has a hack, has a scam? Happens all the time, right? It happens all the time. What happens if that happens to you? Well, then there goes 100% of your net worth, right? You need to be diversifying not only into other coins, but diversifying between competitors. So a big competition right now in the market would be Ethereum and ADA, right? Ethereum and Cardano, right? Big, you know, competition. Digibyte and Nano is another one. You know, Digibyte and Bitcoin, Nano and Bitcoin. These are communities, Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin, communities that basically hate each other. They're at each other's throats 24-7. But what they don't understand and what people don't understand about it is you shouldn't be picking sides, right? This isn't a soccer team, right? This is a financial market. Okay, you may think that one product is better than the other. That's your personal opinion. But the best, most logical thing to do is invest in both, right? Invest in both. If one of them wins, you profit either way, all right? If the fact that you're so willing to jump on a bandwagon in the same area, so, so for example, Nano and Digibyte, they're both Bitcoin rivals, right? The fact that you would choose Nano means that you're probably interested in that area as well, which Digibyte is also lurking in that kind of field in that use case. So naturally, uh, you should be investing in both of them, right? Whether you think Nano is better or not, you know, invest in both of them. Maybe fill your bags a little bit more with Nano. You know, if you think Nano is the stronger product, you truly believe it's going to be revolutionary. You think it's going to, you know, outperform Digibyte massively. Invest more in Nano, but don't leave yourself so exposed because there are millions and millions of people who would, you know, beg to differ. So nothing certain. Think in probabilities. Think in statistics. Think, think in percentages, not dollars. That's another thing I could add to that point. You know, don't think about how many dollars you made from a trade. Think about how much percent, you know, you were in profit from that trade. Because dollars are relative, right? Everyone has dollars, right? Everyone has a different amount of dollars, right? That has nothing to do with your performance. If you made a million dollars in the market, if I said to you guys right now, I made a million dollars in crypto this week, that should mean absolutely nothing to you. Because you guys, for all you guys know, I could have $10 billion. And then making a million dollars would only be making 0.1%, right? But if some, you know, average Joe made a million dollars in the market, but he made it from $1,000, you know, he a thousand X, uh, his, his coins, that's way more impressive, but you need the context, right? So think in percentages. It's all about how much percentages you gain. You know, when, when people say, uh, when Bitcoin's correcting, they very rarely say, oh, Bitcoin corrected 7,000 USD. No, they say Bitcoin corrected 7%. Right, it's all percentages in this financial market. It's all percentages. Uh, FOMO, FOMO is deadly, right? And this is obviously, you know, this is this is an obvious point I was going to bring up in this video. FOMO is deadly, right? Don't be a sheep. FOMO is deadly. I want to bring up a few points about this. You know, if you're seeing on Twitter, for example, Dogecoin, Shiba, Safe Moon, 
all of those moon coins that came out, you know, at the start of the year, if you're seeing on Twitter uh, thousands and thousands of thousands of people advocating for you to buy this coin, you know, be- practically begging you to buy this coin, that should make you suspicious, not hyped, right? First of all, the fact that thousands and thousands and thousands of people are already talking about it means you're probably late already, right? It means that these people are probably, uh, you know, the ones who got in early and they're trying to advertise to everyone they possibly can. If you see, whenever you start seeing Bitcoin on the news, right? If Bitcoin's trading at 100K, you start seeing it on late night shows on the news, that's when you should become cautious, right? Because it means that the word is being spread to the average Joe, okay? And when there's, you know, when we run out of average Joes to buy Bitcoin, the price stalls, okay? And the fact that the word has already spread to the average Joes means that the maximum amount of people who will ever buy Bitcoin have probably already bought Bitcoin in that point in time. Same thing with Dogecoin, same thing with Shiba, same thing with SafeMoon. If you see something circulating, and Solana, Solana's a great example, right? Solana went up 5x before people started getting interested in it. And then the people who got interested in it only made 50%. Right, but it went up 100x. Right, because they, they got in at the very very end, right? and 90% of the people who are shilling you coins consistently. Right, if I was out here and I was shilling you guys Shiba and Dogecoin, right, consistently, that probably just means I want you to buy my bags off me. Right, they're doing it because they want you to pump the price so they can get out. Do you think they actually believe that Dogecoin is going to be the you know global reserve currency? No, of course not. Of course not. Right. And this goes back to it as well. If the coin is being hyped up consistently, and it, specifically if it doesn't actually have an actual use case, that's when you should be extra cautious. Right? Do you know how many people in my personal life bought Dogecoin back in May? Right? I know people who weren't even slightly involved in cryptocurrency. I know people who didn't even know what a Bitcoin was that bought Dogecoin back in May. Right? And in May, you know, at the same time that was happening, there was still very famous, you know, Twitter uh, crypto influencers with hundreds of thousands of followers shilling Dogecoin, right? They were obviously trying to pump the bag so they could get out at a better profit. They knew that, you know, the, if the average Joe is already invested in a coin, it's not going to go up anymore, right? You've reached your target audience. That's it. It needs to correct, right? They knew that. But, you know, this, this goes back to what I was saying. No one's a profit. You can't trust these people. You don't know who they are. You know, they've got nothing to lose by doing this. They're not going to get investigated by the SEC unless they're actually, uh, you know, a, a prominent public figure. You know, these are Twitter. These are these are probably nineteen-year-olds on Twitter. You know, so FOMO's deadly, and learn to avoid FOMO. And that's easier said than done. You know, I will admit that's easier said than done. Everyone FOMOs at some point in time, um, but it's about risk management as well, right? If you want to buy some Dogecoin, buy some Dogecoin. Right? I'm not going to tell you not to buy Dogecoin, but it's about risk management. Should you go all in Dogecoin when it's up? 4x already? No. 100% no. So keep that in mind, you know, and I understand that FOMO and fear of missing out, which goes into greed and panic, very, very core human emotions. And this is why market manipulators, institutions, whales, the people who are basically determining the price of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, the people who are making this cyclical theory happen, This is why they have such an easy time getting money, harvesting money out of the market because they're playing with your emotions, right? They have developed strategies. For example, Wyclov Wyclov accumulation, Wyclov distribution, right? They have developed actual tried and true psychological methods to make you panic, to make you sell, to make you buy at certain points in time that suits their needs so they can make the most amount of money. They don't care about you. Right? Goes back to what I was saying about influencers. Do you think 90% of these people actually care about you? Right? How, and, and if they do, how do you know that? How do you know that? What are they doing for you, you know? So just, just be cautious about FOMO. Be responsible for your wins and losses. Instead, you know, learn instead of following. Now, this is, you know, a fundamental point that I don't think is talked about enough. And essentially, you know, this isn't just this whole not financial advice shit again, Right? Essentially, what this is, is saying, if you make money off of a trade posted to a Telegram group when you had no idea what was going on, you were just blindly following, can you really be proud of that money you made, right? What did you, what did you learn from that? What, 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 you know, what did that, how did that benefit you, you know, outside of monetary gain, 
right? Because the chances are, if you make money from a trade posted to Twitter and you know nothing about the financial markets, you know nothing about technical analysis, you know, you're just given an incentive. All you've done is given yourself an incentive to do that again without actually learning, right? So you're going to repeat that pattern. You're going to make another trade on Twitter. You might win that one, right? You repeat it again. You'll make another trade on Twitter. And then eventually you're going to lose one of those trades because you can't actually critically analyze the charts for yourself. You're just relying on strangers on the internet, right? So eventually you're going to lose. And this is why it is so important to learn for yourself instead of following. There is absolutely no problem at all with listening to other people's opinions on the market. In fact, I would encourage it. And that's why I have this channel. That's why I have my Telegram group. That's why I have my Twitter. Because I know for a fact that there is nothing better than sharing ideas between investors in the market, between companies, institutions, corporations. Everyone needs to be sharing ideas. Everyone needs to be trading ideas so you can get feedback on those ideas, right? It's not all about people taking those ideas, um, you know, at face value. You need to be learning for yourself so you can take someone's ideas, so you can watch my YouTube channel, watch my Telegram group. You can take one of my trading signals, look at the chart for yourself and decide whether you agree with it or not. If you agree with it, great. I've given you guys a trading signal. If you disagree with it, don't take it, right? Don't follow blindly because as I said, nothing is certain. Okay, so be responsible for your own actions, you know, and once you do that as well, in terms of mental health, you know, and I, I want to bring this in here as well, because this market, it's, it's known to affect your mental health, okay, it's very, very stressful, it's a very, very stressful living to make, right, you know, I, I'm sure you guys would be aware of the late nights, you know, looking at the charts, you know, if, you, if you're anything into TA, you know, staying up to 4am, losing sleep, you know, cancelling plans, looking at charts, it's a very, very stressful market, be responsible for what you do. You know, don't be a sheep and follow what other people are doing. If you want to actually improve yourself in the long run, you know, don't worry about what happens in the next month. If you're worried about the next month, go ahead, take some trading signals from Twitter, right? But if you're worried about the long run, you actually want to make something for yourself in this market, you need to be educating yourself, right? You need to be making those trade signals yourself, starting a business yourself. You know, if you truly believe in the space, you need to be innovating and contributing to it, right? Another point here. If you can't explain what a coin does, you shouldn't own it. Very simple stuff, but something that people don't speak about enough. If you can't explain what a coin does, preferably in very simple terms that most people could understand, you should not own the coin. For some reason, you know, I, I don't know why, but you know, I can't say I'm 100% uh, clear from doing this in the past as well, but for some reason, people buy things that they don't know what they do, right? If there's something that you don't understand, like... People don't understand decentralization, for example. You know, they understand the general gist of it. They understand, for for Bitcoin's case, they understand basically what it is. You know, they can tell you it's internet money, right? But they don't actually understand how that is a solution to current government monetary policy. They don't understand the decentralized aspect. They don't understand that, you know, Sato you know Satoshi being absent from any kind of uh, communication with the media is actually, you know, positive for Bitcoin, not negative. They don't understand the essence of whatever makes Bitcoin. You know, explaining something in simple terms is not enough, right? If you're going to invest in something, you need to think critically about it. If you invest in Apple, for example, right? If you're going to, if you're going to buy a stock, you buy an Apple stock and you know that they make, you know, you know that they're involved in the technology field. That's not enough. That's not enough. You need to know what they make. You need to know when the next iPhone's coming out. You need to know when the next MacBook's coming out. You need to know what they're doing in regards to, uh, you know, their competitors. You need to know how they're reacting to Samsung's new phones, right? You can't just know the basics. You need to know every single thing that is happening with that company, with that coin, whatever it is, because your money is on the line. And if you're not educated on what is happening with that coin, what they actually do, what issues they solve, then you're not going to be prepared for the price action when it happens specifically news events, right? This is a great, great thing to, you know, educate yourself. The first thing you should be doing when you look at a coin, go to CoinMarketCap, read the description in CoinMarketCap. Very simple breakdown of the coin. If you can't understand the coin from the description in CoinMarketCap, the chances are you shouldn't be investing in it anyway, because that means the average Joe is not going to be able to understand the coin from the description in CoinMarketCap. 90% of the people 
in the market are not going to take the time out of their day to go over to the website, to go on third-party YouTube videos and try to understand something properly. If they can't understand it in two or three sentences, they're not going to care about it, right? That's why coins like WanChain, WanChain is one of my favorite coins, right? WanChain is one of my favorite coins. I love WanChain to pieces, right? I think it has brilliant, uh, you know, potential in the future. But I completely understand that it's going to be very hard for WanChain to take off the ground simply because it's very hard for people to understand what it actually does, right? People need to be able to understand what something does. And Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin is complicated, but it's kind of surpassing that because it is talked about so much by so many different media outlets and so many different news sources, so many different newspapers that use words that simple people would understand, the average Joe would understand, right? And it's been done for so many years that people do start to understand it now. But with coins like WanChain, you know, I'm using it as an example, it could be any coin, right? Coins that don't have the same outreach in terms of, you know, simplification and advertising as Bitcoin, it's going to be much harder for people to actually get involved in that coin. Because although people do just FOMO into things without looking at the fundamentals, it needs to get to that point first. And it only gets to that point from people looking at the fundamentals. All right, do you think Dogecoin mooned for no reason? Right, that, that's probably not a good example, but safe moon. Do you think it mooned for no reason? Right, it might not have any use case, but people bought that coin, you know, for actual reasons. They were anticipating that hype to come. They knew that a bull market was happening. They knew that every bull market low cap coins pumped to the moon, right? They saw Pancake Swap coming out. They saw that anyone can make a coin on Pancake Swap. They saw the potential in that and they invested it. They weren't gambling, right? The people who were gambling are the people who bought it afterwards, after it was trending on Twitter, after it was trending on all major media outlets, right? If you can't explain what a coin does, you shouldn't own it. And if you can't explain what a coin does, and you know this is this is something that I use in my personal life. You know, I've got a partner who's not necessarily too crypto savvy. If I can't explain, you know, simply to her what a coin that I'm holding does within a few sentences, and if she can't understand it, at least at a fundamental level, then I'm probably not going to buy that coin. It's probably not a good idea for me to be holding that coin because it's too complicated. It's too complicated for the everyday retail investor to get into. And you can you can argue that, well doesn't matter what retail does, they're not the majority of the money, the majority of money in the markets from institutions and whales. Well, in order for institutions and whales to buy a coin, they need to be able to, um, they need to be able to understand that a certain amount of retail investors are going to pump their bags, right? Institutions aren't going to buy something they don't think it's going to go up. If an institution buys WanChain, they are buying it with the knowledge that they are confident that retail investors are going to get interested in WanChain, which means that Retail investors have to understand it to some sort of extent. That's why you get super complex coins with amazing use cases that only rocket scientists could understand that are very, very low on the market cap ranking because no one knows what they does, what they do, sorry. That's it. You know, that's, that's all my points to that video. So to summarize, and I, I suppose the main thing in this video is get in control of your commotion, emotions, you know, get in, in control of your emotions they're natural, you know, they're human, greed, fear, natural emotions, but they are your enemy in this market, right? You need to be able to not conquer them entirely because sometimes your emotions are very useful, right? Logic, uh, you know, fear is useful to a certain extent. If you're actually fearful for a logical reason, like the fact that you've got your life savings in Dogecoin, well then yeah, you should be fearful, right? But that's another thing. It's like, don't overexpose yourself, right? Keep yourself at a level in which you have a safety net. Uh, if you lose a significant portion of the money in the market, you're not necessarily too financially affected by it. Um, but yeah, don't be a sheep. You know, let me know what you think of the series. I have, you know, I think about a dozen different topics I want to be discussing. But this was my first part, my first edition of the series. They're going to be uh, the video is going to be structured similar to this. Let me know what you think. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, and you know. The ultimate goal for this series is, you know, you'll be able to, and I'll, I'll keep the title, I'll have in the title, episode one, don't be a sheep. And then if you want to just wait for ones you actually want to listen to, like I've got ones um, on multiple different, uh, you know, topics, like for example, diversification. Um, I've got ones on how you should educate yourself about TA and stuff like that, and just strategies you should be using to learning. I've got multiple different topics. So if you want to like choose between the topics, that's why I'm going to make it very, very simple, very accessible uh, for that sense. If you don't want to hear about a certain topic, if you know everything about that topic already, um, you know, you don't have to watch the video. Uh, so thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed and I'll catch you uh, in the next one.
Hello Wolfpack, Market Mindset, Part 2, Episode 2, whatever you want to call it. Back here with another episode on this series. Um, and I want to speak about something that, you know, it's been really, uh, you know, circulating in my mind recently. Um, and for those of you who don't know what the series is, this Market Mindset series, it's basically just when I basically just rant at a microphone. Um, and then, you know, it's kind of like a podcast, right? There's nothing on the screen. Um, so, you know, feel free to watch this, uh, you know, or listen to this, whatever you're doing. Uh, in the background, um, but you know, I don't really have any structure to these episodes. I don't really have any like time constraints or anything like that. I just get a little point, like I did my video, um, I think last week or the week before. I uh, don't be a sheep, right? And I just had that one uh, dot point, and I just worked off of that and just kind of, um, you know, said whatever came to my mind. I'm going to be doing the same thing today uh, with the question or the statement. Um, you're probably not a good trader, right? You're probably not a good trader. Uh, I don't care. I don't care if you've made um, money in this bull market. I don't care how much money you've made in this bull market. If you came into this bull market, right, and your first year in crypto was either 2020 or 2021, and you made money, you're probably not a good trader, right? And the reason being, and this is not just to directly insult you guys, right? It's just the reason being that um, you know a bull market in crypto is literally the most exponential market you'll ever see, right? You'll ever see, probably will ever exist, right? It literally just goes up, right? It literally just goes up. You know, uh, if you take away May and June from the equation, uh, you know, we've just been going up since January or December. I think even October, we've just been going up straight up, right? Um, so for you to make money in crypto, well, first of all, right, in this in this bull market so far, doesn't have anything to do with skill, right? It doesn't have anything to do with skill. Yes, it has a little bit to do with looking at the charts and understanding where's a good entry zone, where's a good take profit zone. But realistically, um, unless you were playing with leverage and made made a detrimental decision, you know, you have to understand that ninety percent of people would have made money in this bull market and half of those people wouldn't even have looked at a chart in their life. They probably don't even know what trading view is, right? So understand that just because you've made money in this bull market, it doesn't mean that you should go quit your job right now. It doesn't mean that you should go quit whatever you're doing and drop everything and get into crypto, right? You have not actually proven yourself to the market yet, right? Yes, you may be educated on the charts, right? You may have that experience, right? You may have been in stocks before, but when that 85% drop comes at the end of the year into Q1 and going into 2022, 2023, right? Are you going to make money then? That's the big question, right? Are you going to make money when the market crashes? And that is what determines, you know, if you're a good trader or if you're a bad trader, right? Because at the end of the day, anyone can make money when it's going up, right? But it's about making money when it goes down. Now, that's very important because this all ties into the point that you need to educate yourself, right? You need to educate yourself. Um, this is what happens in bull markets a lot of the time, right? You'll buy into the market. You'll be fresh. You don't know anything about crypto, right? You'll buy into the market. Um, your, your money will go up. You think you're a genius, right? You think you're a genius. You think it's easy. You think it's going to be like that forever. Um, you know, you start taking out loans. And this, I'm, I'm not saying you guys do this, but it's actually very common, right? Uh, not even taking out loans, but using all of your savings, or a significant portion, um, and then eventually the market crashes, and you weren't prepared for that because you haven't actually studied the charts, you haven't actually educated yourself in how the market works, um, and then it crashes and you lose everything. Right? Happens every time. Right? It is a it is a fact. Like I'm not making this up. It is an actual fact that 99% of money people lose money in cryptocurrency. 99% of people lose money in cryptocurrency. That is not, you know, I'm not pulling that out of my ass. Right? That is an actual fact. 99% right? And the reason that is, right, there's multiple reasons, but the reason, the main reason that is, is because those people are not educated, right? They're not educated. They got caught by the money. They thought it was easy, but at the end of the day, no one said this was going to be easy, right? No one said cryptocurrency was going to be easy. No one, all right? And I think all of these Twitter accounts, all of these YouTube channels, can you give you the perception that it's going to be easy? Because all you think is, oh, I just need to listen to these certain people and then I'll know what's going on. And then, but you have to understand that most of those people are biased, right? This is not a personal attack on those people, but most of those people are biased because I can tell you right now, right? When I make a bearish video on my YouTube channel, right? When I make a video um, going over a bearish scenario, it gets maybe a third of the views as the video is going over the bullish scenarios, right? So it, people have a natural attraction to confirmation bias, 
all right? And if you have that natural attraction confirmation bias and you're not educated on the charts and can't make those decisions for yourself, you're just going to fall behind and you're going to be holding when it crashes down 85% into the bear market. So I want to really get this point in your head, right? You know, you're not a good trader yet, right? If you started in 2020, 2021, you're not a good trader yet. You will be a good trader when you can consistently make money when the market is going down or up, right? When you can actually fully divert your emotions away from that sell button, away from that buy button and realize that, hey, you know, I don't have to do anything right now, right? That's that's a very key thing that I've found in my trading experience, right? Um, when I was new to investing, right? When I was new to uh, trading cryptocurrency, um, and I think everyone was a bit like this, right? Uh, I had it in my mind that that you know when the when the price was moving very quickly, I had to make a decision right then and there, right? That's never the case. That is never the case. If you look at the Bitcoin chart, for example, it is a very very rare occasion that this chart goes straight down in a short period of time. It's happened, but it's very rare, right? Most of the time, it drops down a little bit. It stagnates that area for about 12 hours. It drops down a little bit more, right? You have actual time to make that decision. You don't need to make that decision right now when it's dropping, right? Because all that's going to do is make you make, you know, an uninformed decision, an uninformed decision. You know, you're not going to have time to look at all the charts you need to look at to realize, hey, is the bottom actually in or is it going to drop more, right? And there comes panic selling, right? And that's exactly what those institutions, those market manipulators want you to do, right? They want you to panic sell. They actually want you to panic sell. And the reason I know this is because the manipulation wouldn't exist in the first place if the if the market manipulators didn't want you to panic sell. Because in order for manipulation to exist, it means the asset is desired, right? Do you think these people are coming into cryptocurrency, coming into Bitcoin and manipulating the market for fun? No, they're doing it to accumulate Bitcoin. They want you to sell so they can buy lower. That, the fact that the market is manipulated in the first place, should be an indicator to you that the market is actually very bullish, Right, because smart money, people who have the means, have the capacity to actually drop the price at, at the click of their finger, right? They want to accumulate this asset. Why would you give it to them? You know, why would you give the power of this asset to them? Hold it, hold it, you know. And it's things like that, and that's not the point of this video, but it's things like that 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 distinguish, uh, you know, a good trader from a bad trader, right? Because the understanding you know, things that aren't even necessarily about the charts, like market manipulation, right? Like port portfolio management, you know, like, you know, anything regarding, you know, fundamentals, you know, fundamental analysis is actually way more important, right? You can understand everything you want about the charts, right? You can understand everything about the TA, but if you don't know how to find a good project, if you don't know how to find a good coin, you know, if you don't know when the right time um, to, to panic sell, panic buy is, uh, you know, if there even is a right time. Um, you know, it doesn't matter how many SMAs, how many, you know, bull market support bands, how many RSIs you look at, you're not going to make money, right? You need to have uh, knowledge of cryptocurrency. You need to have knowledge of what sectors are going to emerge. You need to have knowledge of how the money flows in cryptocurrency from Bitcoin into altcoins back into Bitcoin, you know, on a four-year cycle basis. Uh, in order to actually succeed. And that's where the education comes in, right? No one's going to give you this money for free. You know, when you go to university, right? If, if any of you have gone to university, right? Um, you know, you don't just jump right in. Say you're studying, a, a, you know, you want to be an astronaut, right? For an example, right? You don't just go straight to space, right? You don't just go straight to space, right? You have to do, you know, probably years, right? Probably close to a decade or more of mathematics, you know, astrophysics, science, whatever, whatever it may be, chemistry, I don't know, you know, I'm not an astronaut, but you'd have to do a significant amount of study before you could even put that spacesuit on, right? And I think with cryptocurrency, with trading and investing in stocks, people just kind of assume that you can just go right in and that's an okay thing to do. That's never an okay thing to do, never, all right? If you don't understand what you are investing in, if you don't understand how that market moves, you should not be there. You should not be there. I don't care how bullish the market is. I don't care if, if you know, it's Q4 and you've got to get in, you don't have time to learn. 
You should not be investing in something you don't know what it is because then you're not taking personal responsibility for your actions and you're blaming your actions on someone else when it goes wrong because you're going to be blaming that on someone else. When the market crashes and you haven't done the research, you are going to blame it on someone else. That is a natural human instinct, right? It's self-defense. It's defending yourself, right? You know, you don't want to be the responsible person for your actions, but as soon as you accept the responsibility, you can understand that, hey, it's actually my responsibility if I lose, and it's my responsibility if I win, and you can start taking pride in your wins, and you can start learning from your losses. If you have that victim mentality, if you have the victim mentality telling you that everything you do, right, is because of someone else, right, you're never going to be a good trader, never, because you're never going to have, you know, the actual motivation to go out there on YouTube, on, on Google, read some books and actually learn about the charts, actually learn about what Bitcoin actually is. You're never going to have that motivation because you're going to think you're just, you know, seaweed in the ocean, right? You're just drifting, you know, and, and, and how are you going to do this for a living if you're just drifting? Because I can tell you right now, right? I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say, right? I think 50% of people, at least 50% of this people, you know, watching this channel right now, watching this video, want to retire from their cryptocurrency earnings, ideally. All right, I'm going to say that, 50%, right? Not all of them. I understand a lot of people like their jobs, like what they do. You know, that's that's completely fine. But 50% of people, at the least, absolutely hate where they are in life, hate their job, and see crypto as one of the only ways out. You know? Um, and I think that, you know, if you see yourself like that, it is absolutely paramount. It is absolutely paramount to go to the bookstore go online and actually learn and stop listening to the biased, you know, influences out here, right? Stop listening to the bullish arguments, you know, for once, listen to the bearish arguments, you know, you know, I, I, I understand that, you know, I completely believe that in Q4, we're going to be very bullish in Bitcoin. Q1 is going to be very bullish for altcoins, right? I 100% believe that, you know, to the point where I don't need to see any more bullish arguments, Right, I'm sick of seeing bullish arguments because all it does is like, yeah, you know, maybe I am right. You know, maybe I am a genius. I'm correct. No, I like to see the bearish arguments because even though I don't agree with them, it gives me some perspective. Right, there's nothing worse than confirmation bias. There's nothing worse than confirmation bias and validation in this market. Nothing worse. I can tell you that right now. It sounds ridiculous, but there's nothing worse than people agreeing with you. Right, because if people agree with you, you automatically shut down the door to any other alternative opinion. When you're in a say, say you're at a say you're at a, a function, whatever it may be, you're with a group of friends, right? You know, you bring up a political view. I'm not going to bring up any specific political views. Bring up a political view. Uh, you know, if those friends disagree with that view and start giving you counterpoints, it's going to force you to be critical about, you know, your viewpoint. It's going to force you to re-evaluate your viewpoint. Yes, you might not change your viewpoint. It's very rare people actually do, but it's going to force you to think about it and actually consider the other arguments because you're with people you respect, right? You know, in a different scenario, if you go to that argue, if you go to that group chat, if you go to that discussion, whatever it is, and all of your friends agree with you, all of your friends agree with your political view, you know, there's going to be no counter argument. You know, none of you are going to say, well, well, you know, I think that, uh, you know, they have a really good point when they say this. And I think that, no, 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 you're just going to be like, yeah, okay, maybe I am right. You know, maybe I am right. And then when you build that group think mentality, when you get in that, that, I guess you could say it's a bandwagon, right? Um, you know, you're going to be naturally less open to other viewpoints. And that's why I don't like the idea. I don't like the idea of constantly labeling yourself as a bull, constantly labeling yourself as a bear, right? I understand that, you know, being a bull just means you think the market is going to go up, but it automatically categorizes you on a team, right? On a team. And if you think you're on a team, obviously the other team is your enemy. Realistically, the other team should be your friend, right? Because you should be exchanging ideas with that other team, right? Instead of fighting them. Because if you fight them, you're naturally going to have that confirmation bias from which you're trying to invalidate all their points, right? Instead of looking at them and thinking, hey, could this actually happen, right? There's still people out here in the market, for example, who are calling for 20k Bitcoin, still, still, right? You know, and I'm not going to discredit these people immediately, right? Yes, I think it's not going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's very unlikely we're going to 20k, 20K Bitcoin, right? Um, you know, we've invalidated all of those resistance. You know, I'm not going to talk about TA, but 
I think it's very unlikely. But the point is, when I see a post on Twitter, when I see a video on YouTube, very rarely, about how the market's going to go to 20k, I actually watch it. Right? I, I actually read that post. I don't just laugh, think, huh, what an idiot, and then scroll past it. And I think a lot of people do that. You know, and I, th- I, I get up my chart and I chart it out and I see whether it makes sense. And if it doesn't make sense, cool, who cares, you know? But there's so much benefit in having that objective point of view. Um, and I think that's what makes a good trader. I think that's what makes a good trader, right? You know, so I guess the key points that I just wanted to summarize are, you know, be open to other viewpoints. Realize that you're not some trading genius, you know, when you've only been in the market for one year. You know, how could you be? You know, you don't, you don't, you know, doctors aren't very good at their jobs if they've only been in medical school for one year. So why do you think you're a trading genius if you've only been trading for one year? You know, this thing takes years to master. Yes, you can be decent. Yes, you can hold your own. Yes, you can trade symmetrical triangles and channels and wedges. But, you know, in order to learn, you know, full-on trading strategies, you know, full-on, you know, in-depth theories, on-chain, on-chain analytics is a perfect example, right? On-chain data is naturally very confusing, naturally, just by nature, uh, especially if you're into making on-chain metrics, right? Very complicated, right? Those people know what they're doing, right? If you can't do something like that, you're not an expert in this field, so what makes you think you should quit your job and get into it? You know, would you quit your job um, to get into something you're not an expert in, in, in any other aspect of life? You know, would you would you quit your job uh, wherever you may work uh, to be a soccer player if you've only played soccer for a year? No, you wouldn't. So why would you do it with this, right? Understand that this is no different to any other profession. No different. You still need to do the research. You can't just sit there watching YouTube. You have to actually do it yourself. Read, watch. You know, read, watch. Where's the perfect time to do that? Bear market. The bear market is literally the best time you will ever get to educate yourself in the market because it's it's basically, you know, people say the bear market's three years. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think it's three years until the next bull market, but the market usually drops for about a year and a half, right? And then it bottoms out and then it heads up slowly, you know? So in that year and a half period, I guess you could say three years, you literally have nothing but time. Nothing interesting is going to be happening with the charts. You know, you could basically just assume, all right, it's going down this week. It's going down next week. It's going down next month. It's probably going to go down next year, all right? So you've got an abundance of time on your hands to actually read. What are you going to do with that time? What are you going to do with that time? Are you going to go back to work, forget about crypto until the next bull market? Or are you going to educate yourself on cryptocurrency? You know, educate yourself on TA, educate yourself on how to find good coins, you know, potentially start your own crypto business or get plans for it, you know, and actually benefit yourself in the future. Or are you just going to be one of those people who grass hops over to the next big thing and then comes back when crypto's at, you know, 500k Bitcoin? You know, just think about it. Think about it, right? Anyway, guys, uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Sorry if you get get a bit like, you know, (laughs) stuttery and stuff. I'm literally just improving these whole videos. Um, I don't have any script. I literally just have what I have on this screen right here. And it's just basically me just rambling my thoughts. So, um, you know, I want to say one more thing as well. You know, uh, you know, props to you, you know, props to you. If you've watched to the end of this video, props to you, because it actually shows that, you know, not only are you interested in just the price of the asset, you're actually interested in, in benefiting yourself mentally, because half of this market is psychological, right? Half of this market, yes, you could say it's technicals, it's learning how to do that, learning how to do this. Half of the market is a mindset. If you don't have the right mindset, you're never going to profit. Simple as that. So props to you for watching this video. Um, anyway. Thanks for watching. Catch you guys in the next one. See ya. Hello, Wolfpack Market Mindset. Um, bringing you another video here on investing psychology. Um, and, you know, instead of just for TA, I'm breaking it up. This is a podcast type series that we do. Don't really use the screen too much. So feel free to, uh, you know, chuck this on in the background with whatever you're doing right now, whatever that may be. Um, you know, I like having a series like this where I can just t- talk and, you know, get my thoughts out. Uh, about not necessarily the market, but the the kind of person it takes uh, to invest in the cryptocurrency market specifically, but also kind of relates to stocks as well. Um, but you know, mainly the cryptocurrency market, um, because you know, most people 
uh, as, as I would have said before, most people lose money in this market, you know. Um, it's not by any means free money, right, by any means. And no matter how hard uh, the media and no matter how hard influencers uh, outside of the crypto space will try to convince you that it is free money, uh, particularly on TikTok, right? TikTok investors are sponsored by coins. They always try to tell you that it's free money, basically, right? They, they try to say it's very simple. There's not much effort to it. Um, they're wrong, right? They're either wrong or they're lying to you for their own financial gain, right? Because it's definitely not easy. Um, even with the cyclical theory, uh, it's definitely not easy. And the reason it's not easy, and you guys can say whatever you want, right? I've heard so many people say different things about how this bull market is so different to every other bull market. We've seen things we've never seen in other bull markets. Not correct, right? Not correct, right? Fundamentally, right? Yes, we may have had an extensive corrective period, uh, but fundamentally, uh, we are still in line with the four-year cycle theory to the T, right? Perfectly, right? We are still, still saw that September correction down to the bull market support band. <clears throat> you know, we're still seeing uh, a rise in Q4. We're still probably most likely going to be topping out in late December or potentially early January, probably late December, right? Um, you know, so everything is still intact uh, until uh, until proven otherwise, and that hasn't been proven yet. So everyone's saying that, uh, you know, this bull market has been so different and this is the worst bull market. No, that's just simply not true, right? Everything has happened how it is meant to happen. Uh, and that's the thing that's important with crypto, right? It's important to understand that cryptocurrency, um, it moves how it is meant to move, right? It's not like the stock market. It's completely different. It is a cyclical mover. After every halving, there is a bull market without fail, right? Obviously, we don't have many data points right now, but that has that is what we've seen so far, right? Three times repeated. Um, and so there's no reason for us to just throw that out the window um, because, you know, right now we're seeing the fourth time that's happened. Uh, at some point, uh, the likelihood of it being a coincidence uh, significantly goes down, right? And I think that it's it's probably a 95% chance that uh, the four-year cycle theory is not really a theory. It's actually a fact, right? Um, you know, regardless of all of that, uh, I want to say that even though it is so structured, even though there was there is literally a cheat sheet if you zoom outwards uh, in how to make money in crypto, um, you know, even though all of that is there, most people still lose money. Right, most retail investors. I think it's something like you know up to ninety percent potentially. I've heard many sources, but uh, it's it's definitely most. But it could be as high as ninety percent of people over the long run. Right, I'm not talking about in a bull market. I'm talking about over the long run lose money trading cryptocurrency. Right, and that's interesting. That's interesting to think about, and you got to think about why that is. Uh, is it because of you know crypto being unpredictable and crypto being too volatile? No, not really. Uh, volatility is not a good or bad thing, right? Volatility is completely neutral. Um, is it because crypto is going down? No, crypto is not going down, right? If you look at the long-term pattern, uh, it's it's trending upwards over a long period of time. Right? It's because of the emotions, right? It's because of your emotions. It's because of your emotions telling you, and I'll, I'll bring a few of my points up here. We've got our first point, but it's because of your emotions telling you that, um, you know, we need to act now. I need to act now. I need to sell now, buy now. You don't need to do anything right now. Yes, this is, this is a high volatility market, but you know, think about all the times in cryptocurrency that we have dropped substantially and never returned to that point. Uh, basically none, right? Because we're at new all-time highs on Bitcoin right now. Uh, if you had confidence, if you had faith and held uh, through the downturns, you know, obviously this, this doesn't apply for most altcoins, um, but on Bitcoin specifically, you would be in the green, you know, regardless of where you bought in history, regardless of what happened, regardless of all the, you know, quote unquote manipulation that's gone on. Uh, the point is the whole cryptocurrency space is trending upwards in time. And the fact that the whole, um, you know, the, the amount of people in profit is trending downwards while the cryptocurrency space is trending upwards uh, just goes to show how um, this, this market, particularly the crypto market, tends to attract uh, less educated people um, in terms of technical analysis, in terms of fundamental analysis. Um, and and the, the one way to overcome that, right, is to first of all sit down, and this brings me to my first point, when you start investing, when you start trading, whatever you want to do in crypto, sit down and ask yourself, what, what kind of trader do I want to be? Uh, and you could label this question in, in, in another way as well. Do I want to be a trader? Uh, do I want to be a, a scalp trader, a swing trader? Or do I want to be a long-term investor? Right? Historically, and believe what you want to believe, you know, if you made 10x on Dogecoin, you know, you might not believe what I'm saying this, but historically, long-term investors are the most profitable 
you know, on average in a large pool of people are the most profitable um, in, in cryptocurrency investing, right? That is because they've held through the downturns uh, and they just hold no matter what. And the, the fact of the matter is this space is trending upwards. You know, whether you believe we're going to 100k on Bitcoin this year or not, uh, the space, the whole cryptocurrency market is trending upwards and it has done that uh, for, for a decade, right? And there's no reason uh, in my mind um, even with the FUD, even with Tether, government manip manipulation, even with Evergrande, all of this FUD that's coming out, right? It's still going to trend upwards. If you believe in the technology, if you believe that Bitcoin is a better version of gold, if you believe that Bitcoin is a better version of fiat, you know, it's going to be trending upwards because at the end of the day, long-term technology prevails, right? And long-term investors, uh, even cyclical investors, right? I'd consider that long-term, right? Uh, anything over a few months, I'd probably consider long term. Um, you know, they they always profit in the market because they understand how it works. All right? The fact that they will, they the fact that they are holding long term, uh, the fact that they are holding Bitcoin long term, they're buying Bitcoin, and holding it means that they understand the use case to a certain extent, and they understand that it's a good investment, right? Scalp traders which is the most common type of cryptocurrency investor, right? Scalp traders. And what a scalp trader is, is essentially uh, a day trader, right? It's someone who trades mostly intraday, could be intraweek. Um, you know, they, they trade like that. So very short time frame. use leverage, use futures. That is what the vast majority of people in cryptocurrency trade, right? And that's where the vast majority of volume comes from, scalp trading. Um, and those people are most likely to lose money in cryptocurrency. And, and there's a simple reason to that, you know, one, greed, right? Because the fact that you're scalp trading in the first place means you want that money quick, right? So it's essentially like a casino to you, like it has the same appeals, right? It's like, it's like a slot machine, right? You want that money quick. Um, the second reason is, you know, miseducation about technical analysis. Uh, you know, most scalp traders wouldn't be too, uh, you know, savvy in terms of technical analysis. If they were, they would understand that, you know, you have a better chance of making money in the long run. Uh, swing trading, uh, which is where most of the educated people in cryptocurrency make their money, swing trading, right? Um, but, you know, scalp traders tend to be less educated in the market, less confident in the use case, right? As, as shown by the fact that they're like scalp trading on an intraday basis, right? They don't want to get caught out by uh, things they think could end Bitcoin or end cryptocurrency, for example. They don't want to be overly invested in terms of time frame. Uh, so they're less educated on what cryptocurrency actually is. And that leads into the problem, well, why are you investing something you don't know what it is, right? These, these are just common facts. And that's why most people lose money scalp trading, right? It tends to appeal to people who are greedy, uh, less educated. Obviously, there is a time and a place for scalp trading. I'm not going to say I don't scalp trade, right? I do scalp trade. Um, but I'm saying the vast majority of people would end up losing money doing that. Uh, and it's very easy to see why. Um, you know, there's there's so many. And, you know, the, one of the main sources of new people coming into cryptocurrency right now would actually be TikTok, right? Uh, you know, TikTok. And, and one of the reasons why scalp trading is so popular, because TikTok you know, you have, I think it's 30 seconds or something uh, to explain, uh, for example, a trading, you know, technique. Uh, and you can't really explain a trading technique in 30 seconds, but you get these TikTok influencers with millions of views, uh, you know, explaining these trading techniques that so-called, uh, you know, are, are, you know, bulletproof and they work 100% of the time. And then you get people copying those trading techniques from that 30 second video uh, who don't really know anything about the market, don't really know what they're investing in, don't really know what they're trading. Um, and they'll lose money, right? And that's that's just a fact, right? I'm not making this up. That's a fact. You can look it up if you want to. Uh, you know, I think it's something like 95% of scalp traders, 90% of day traders, right? It's another word for it, uh, lose money, uh, not even in just crypto, but in stocks as well. And that, you know, as I said, stems from uh, lack of education about the market. Um, you know, and then you can look at swing trading, right? And this is, this is the last category, and this is what I fall mostly into, and this is what I highly recommend people fall mostly into, right? Uh, so you have long-term investing, day, uh, day trading or scalp trading, and then swing trading. Uh, and swing trading is investing, you could say it's investing cyclically, right? Uh, it's investing for, you know, anywhere from like, you know, a week to like a few months, basically, right? Uh, there's, no, there's no solid definition of what it is, but it's essentially a medium term investment. And this is what I most align with in cryptocurrency because the way the money flows from Bitcoin into old coins back to Bitcoin in the cryptocurrency market matches this type of investing perfectly, right? Uh, for example, right now we see in Q4, October, November, December, Bitcoin usually outperforms altcoins. So you would invest in Bitcoin at the start of October, right? When December hits, you'd sell your Bitcoin, throw it into altcoins, right? Sell your altcoins in mid to late January, right? You're holding for medium 
periods of time based on the macro theory, right? So you're not just holding and never selling no matter what, like a long-term investor would do. Um, you're trying to catch the trend uh, in a reasonable time frame. Um, you know, a time frame big enough where any th random piece of news wouldn't just destroy your whole investment portfolio. Uh, but, you know, a time frame small enough uh, to capture those trends perfectly and not see any downside. Uh, so that's where I would say um, is is the most money to be made in the market, swing trading, right? And that's why I tend to only look at the, well, my most important chart to look at actually is anything above the daily chart, right? I think that anything below uh, the hourly chart, looking at anything below the hourly chart, looking at the minute charts, simply just plays into your emotions, right? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many bullish MACD crosses are coming in on the 30 minute chart on Bitcoin. That's not gonna matter in a week, right? And what matters is what matters in a week, okay? Um, so long-term, you know, and all of the technical indicators as well, it ties into technical analysis. The longer term you go, the more meaning those indicators have, right? A 200 day SMA on a weekly chart uh, sorry, a 200 SMA on the weekly chart means more than a 200 SMA on the daily chart, right? In terms of support, uh, it's it's been building up for longer. It's at a more solid defended position. You know, it just means more, right? And same thing, a bullish MACD cross on a weekly chart means more than a bullish MACD cross on a five minute chart, right? It has more behind it. More people are looking at it. More people care about it. Uh, you know, it takes longer to happen. So more people will have seen that it's happening and will have prepared to buy when it does happen. Whereas a five minute chart, you can miss it if you don't look at the charts for 30 minutes, right? Not many people are going to be by that. Not many people are going to be buying because of it. Um, and that's why swing trading, in my opinion, is the superior way to invest because you can catch those trends very nicely. And, you know, the data simply suggests that you can make way more than uh, a scalp trader does uh, and make considerably amount more than a, a long-term investor does. And by the way, if you're a swing trader, uh, you can also long-term invest, right? You can have a percentage of your portfolio that you dedicate to long-term investing. You can also have a percentage of your portfolio that you dedicate to scalp trading. So you don't really have to fall into one category, but it's what you predominantly do that kind of defines what you are as a trader. Um, and I think a lot of new investors make the mistake of jumping straight into scalp trading, when in reality, um, um, you know, the only successful day traders uh, are people with, you know, most likely years of experience, most likely thousands of hours studying the charts, you know, and that's just a fact. It's like, it's like jumping straight into a professional soccer league when it's your first time playing soccer. It doesn't make sense. You know, you have to start off with the, uh, the smaller leagues, the local leagues, going to state, going to nationals, and then go to international. You can't just jump straight into international soccer, right? Um, when you don't even know how to kick a ball, right? It just doesn't make sense in any, any other part of life. So why would it make sense uh, trading crypto? And, you know, I think that's something that people forget. They forget that this is a skill it's not just something you can do for fun right it's not just like you know uh placing a sports bet or you know going to the casino it's not like that it may seem like that and people on tiktok may make it look like that but it's actually not like that this is a very um you know it's a very professional market it's a very professional market you know there's a reason why there's whole institutions whole firms on wall street uh, you know, dedicated to financial markets and, and, and trading financial markets. There's a reason why university degrees are about financial markets. It's because it's not as simple as people make it look. So that's the first thing I'd recommend. You know, find out uh, what kind of trader you want to be. Um, and, you know, if you want to be a scalp trader and it's your first time going into crypto, that's fine. But you just, just understand that you need to work your way there, right? And the best way to work your way there is start with the long term and head into shorter time intervals as you start to understand more about the charts. All right. So the whole concept of manipulation only works because of emotion, right? And this is tying back into our point about emotions, right? And and the last the last point I will add to the last point the reason why scalp trading as well, one of the reasons why scalp trading is bad, you know, as, as a, in, a, in a general sense is because um, scalp trading requires you to be looking at the charts constantly. You know, if you're taking a trade for less than an hour, uh, anything that happens, even though it might be a 0.01% move, um, looks massive to you because you're only in the trade for only the very short term. So anything that would be considered irrelevant in the longer term looks like it's a really big deal and that plays with your emotions much more. So that's why I'd say they lose the most money. But going into this point, the whole concept of manipulation only works because of emotion. Well, it's quite simple, right? It's quite simple. Manipulation only works, right? Market manipulation by whoever it may be that is manipulating the market, right? Only works because people are emotional, 
right? And there's nothing wrong with being emotional, right? This isn't, you know, I'm, I'm not a psychologist or something, but the point is, is that if you're going to be, if you're going to be successful in this market, if you're going to have uh, a considerable amount in your of your wealth in this market, you better damn well learn to control your emotions, right? There's a difference between being unemotional, being, a, I don't know, a psychopath in the market, uh, and being uh, overly emotional and, uh, you know, not being able to control your emotions. You need to be able to control them because emotions to a certain extent, even in the financial markets, are beneficial, right? Because they tell you that, hey, maybe I shouldn't take this trade. Um, you know, maybe I should sell now because I need to pay my, you know, I need to pay this, pay that. Uh, it doesn't really seem. And, you know, fear to a certain extent is a good thing because if you're fearing that, you know, if you don't sell now, you're not going to be able to pay your rent. Well, that's positive, isn't it? Right. That's just logical. Right. Um, but fear in the sense that, you know, when the market drops, when the market drops, uh, and I'm not talking about the bull market top at the end of the year in December, right? Obviously, if the market tops out in December and it drops, you have a correction in December, you should be scared, right? You should be scared because that's what the cyclical theory suggests is the end of the bull market. But I'm talking about all of these little corrections we've had along the way, right? The correction we had from 52K down to 40K a couple of weeks ago, right? It's just fear. It's just fear. It's just emotions. It's got nothing to do with any of the fundamentals. It's got nothing to do with any of the cyclical theory. It's just emotions playing out over and over and over again because investing psychology repeats over and over and over again. And because psychology and mindsets and the general sentiment in the market repeats over and over and over again when certain patterns repeat, um, you see the price repeat itself over and over and over again. And that's one of the reasons why we have such clear cyclical theory on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency because it's literally just human emotion playing out over and over and over. And, you know, we can capitalize on that. Um, but you know, as soon as you understand that the only reason this market is being manipulated is because the people who are manipulating the market want to profit from the market themselves um, by buying the asset lower when everyone is sold, you understand that manipulation is actually a really good thing, right? It's really good because it demonstrates that there is a desire to be in this market by the institutions, by whoever is, you know, whoever may be manipulating the market. So having emotion when you see those clearly manipulative price drops, you know, that 10% drop we had in less than an hour uh, about two months ago, you know, when you see that, that's so clearly manipulation that you shouldn't be selling, you should be buying, right? Because it's just so simple. It's like, well, this couldn't have happened any other way but market manipulation, right? There's no logical way that 10% of all cryptocurrency holders sold their bags uh, in this one hour period of time. Um, and so, you know, what's happening? Well, it's manipulation by people who ultimately want to buy lower when everyone is sold. And once you realize that, uh, you know, manipulation only works because they're trying to capitalize on your human emotions, they're trying to capitalize on your fear, uh, the voice in your head telling you to sell when it drops that fast, um, you realize that, hey, I shouldn't be selling, I should be buying. And that's, that's another really important point. Um, understand, you know, as it says right here, understand the whole concept of manipulation only works because they're, you know, they're basically relying on you being fearful. Um, and and you'll notice that, you know, that drop we had uh, a couple months ago on Bitcoin from 53K to 40K wasn't as big as the drop we had from the mid 50s into the low 30s, right? And that's because more people started to understand this. And when it happened, less people were willing to uh, concede into that fear and sell, right? As more people get educated on the market, as the bull market goes on longer, uh, the market manipulators start to have less control. And that is the reason why we pump in Q4. Because by Q4, you know, most people just aren't willing to sell, right? They, they, they have their eyes set on January or December, and they're not willing to sell. And so the market manipulators lose control. They realize that, hey, all right, now's the time to pump the market. And then they play on your greed, right? So they go from switching it from your fear to your greed. And then... You know, this is why right now, even right now, even though we just broke all-time highs, I don't recommend you buy Bitcoin right now because I feel like Bitcoin is overvalued, right? We've just pumped up uh, in, you know, a three to four week period over 60% on Bitcoin, right? It's so obviously, uh, you know, a, a, a greedy move to buy in right now. You know, why didn't you buy in a couple months ago? You know, why didn't you buy in a couple weeks ago? Right now is the time to buy altcoins, but I'm not getting into it here. You know, I just, I'm just saying this, you know, just off the bat here, because I do freestyle these videos, right? I don't have a script. I'm just saying random things that come to my head. Um, but the whole point is because of emotions, right? And people like buying things when they're higher. You know, there's a reason why Bitcoin will go to above 100K. 
Uh, a lot of people always ask me, no one's going to buy Bitcoin at 100K. Why do you think it's going to go to 100K? Let me tell you right now, people would be so much happier buying Bitcoin at 100K than they would at 30K because they want to have the confirmation that it can move upwards, even though the potential return is less from 100K. And even though the potential loss is less from 100K, they want to feel like they're part of a group, right? They want the reassurance. It's like, you know, that people, you know, naturally, and it's not an insult to this human race, but naturally people are sheep, right? They like being, you know, confirmed. They, they like their viewpoints confirmed by other people. They like seeing that people agree with them. Uh, you know, if you're supporting a political party, you love to see when the vast majority of the population agrees with you because it makes you feel like you're correct. Uh, and the higher Bitcoin goes... Uh, the more likely people, regular people, the ob you know, the common Joe is going to buy Bitcoin because they're going to feel like they're correct simply by the sheer amount of people who are validating them just by buying. All right, on to the next point here. Um, and that point is this. Uh, crypto is more volatile uh, than other financial markets, right? So in, in comparison to the stock market. Um, and, you know, you don't ever have to act now, right? Just because it's more volatile. Um, and, you know, I feel like the reason why people feel like they have to act now, right? It's because this market doesn't sleep. It doesn't rest. It's the definition of a free market. It's open 24-7. It's not controlled by any centralized organization at all. Um, and I think that when people have all of these factors that aren't in the traditional markets um, staring at them right in the face, uh, they feel more con compelled to do things in the moment because it's a much faster paced market, right? It's quick, 10%, 20%, uh, you know, overnight when you're sleeping, it doesn't matter. It doesn't stop. It never calms down. And when you get all of those factors coming in, especially when you're uneducated, especially when you're new uh, and you're not used to it, right? You start to understand that, hey, um, this is really scary. You know, I need to act very quickly or I'm going to lose my money. Uh, or I'm going to lose my gains, right? But the fact of the matter is, and I, I've learned this uh, over my time in the crypto market, this is that, you know, stuff, you know, as I said earlier in this video, right? It's the same point I bring up earlier in this video. I want to really emphasize it is that stuff very rarely ever drops and doesn't return to that region. If something drops, right, it doesn't just drop and not come back ever, right? Very rarely, even in altcoins, right? It's a very rare scenario where your altcoin will drop and never return to the price it's been at unless you're in the peak of a bull market, right? Every time, for example, on most altcoins, unless something's bad has happened to them in terms of the fundamentals, but on most, you know, top 100 altcoins, they have dropped from May and they will no doubt return to those prices again in January or December, right? So, Yes, it may cause you a slight inconvenience in, in which you need to hold for a bit longer. But, um, you know, the fact of the matter is, if you're panicked enough uh, to make the decision of buying or selling right now, right then, right there, it's probably dropped a substantial amount already. Right? It's probably down 10%, let's say. Uh, what are the chances of it dropping another 10%, you know, by the time you wake up the next morning? You know, stuff doesn't just drop 30% overnight on a daily basis, right? Right. If you are already panicked, if you're at the point, you know, where you're panicked about something, uh, it would have had to drop a substantial amount already. Um, and, you know, when it's dropped a substantial amount, you start to get people buying the dip, you start to get people coming in, uh, and, it, and it becomes less and less likely it's going to drop more. And this is the same psychology behind it going up, right? If it's gone up 10% today already, the chances of it going up another 10% uh, diminish every other 10% it goes up, right? And by the time you're up 30% in a day, well, you can basically bet on the fact that it's not going to go any higher than that, right? Uh, and if it does, it will probably drop very sharply very shortly afterwards. So it works both ways. And I, I think ultimately that comes back to this market not being like other markets, right? It's open 24-7. As I just said, it's un unregulated by any centralized authority. Um, and it, it makes it feel like a bit of a free-for-all where, in, you know, traditional markets, you don't have things like that, right? When 5 p.m. hits or when 4.30 hits, whatever the time the market shuts, right? Um, you know, it's done. And you have the night time to think about what you're going to do, plan for tomorrow. You don't have that in this, right? It never stops. And, you know, that, that really makes this a breeding ground for manipulation because market manipulators understand that the emotions, the emotional, you know, and the stakes are already high for cryptocurrency investors through the volatility, through the fact that it's not regulated. Um, and so it's very easy for them to flip your bias from bullish to bearish on a daily basis. Very easy. Uh, and that's why um, cryptocurrency, and I think the main risk for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, right, is the fact that 
you know, a lot of the wealth is going to be controlled by big institutions, big corporations at the end of the day, you know, when push comes to shove and it does get adopted because by that time they would have had years and years to manipulate the market to acquire as much as they possibly can. Uh, you know, you think about MicroStrategy who, who holds, you know, I, I think it's like hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin, right? Massive amounts of Bitcoin. Imagine if Bitcoin is, is adopted on a global scale, uh, they would they would own, you know, massive amounts of the money in the world massive amounts a massive percent just one company you know i think that's a big risk of cryptocurrency and yes you could say that oh well you can split it as many times as you want you know you can split it uh you can split stats you know all this kind of stuff but at the end of the day uh wealth distribution is going to be interesting to see uh and that's due to the fact that there there is that opportunity for uh and there still will be for a few more years right or even decades uh for institutions big corporations to manipulate the market quite easily due to the fact that this is a very new market that people are still kind of skeptical on uh and hence they will act very emotionally uh and emotions open the gateway to manipulation as we just talked about in the last point um our next point think in percentages and don't think in dollars, right? So this is one way where you can start to control your emotions. You can start to control what's happening. Think in percentages because, you know, if I make, if I say, for example, I make a trade uh, and I make a million dollars from that trade, right? I make a million dollars from that trade and I go and show everyone in the wolf pack, look at the million dollars I just made in this trade. That shouldn't mean anything to you, right? Because for all you know, I could have been trading for billion dollars and that a million dollar uh, profit could have only been a 1% gain. Uh, and a 1% gain is not impressive, right? But if, for example, I was trading with $1,000 and I made a million dollars, that's an about that, you know, what is that? I don't know, a thousand or 10,000% gain. That's impressive, right? Um, percentages mean much more than dollars. And if you if you program yourself, you program your mind to think in percentages rather than dollars, you will naturally uh, be more immune to the emotional side because you'll start to uh, you'll start to create a block in your mind between the money uh, and the crypto assets, right? So, for example, uh, if you think of it like you invest ten thousand dollars in uh, crypto in Bitcoin, for example, and Bitcoin goes down thirty percent, well, you could look at it like, well, I've just I'm lose I'm at a loss of three thousand dollars, or you could look at it like I'm down thirty percent. Um, and you know, I think there definitely is a psychological difference between those two things, uh, because when you start to think, well, I've, I'm down three thousand dollars, you start to think about all the things you could have bought with that three thousand uh, dollars, all the ways you could have used that three thousand dollars in different investments, uh, and you start to feel. Uh, a sadness about that and that leads into fear of losing more whereas if you think of it i'm down 30 percent it basically just means you're in the negative right and you don't think about anything other than that well i'm in the negative uh how am i going to get out of this this rut that i'm in right uh, so there definitely is a psychological uh benefit to looking at it in percentages instead of dollars um and the last point at least i think it's the last point yeah the last point i want to bring up here uh is when the market moves do you trust yourself to sell um, and this is the big question I want everyone watching this video to ask themselves right now. It's the last thing I put in this video, uh, and there's a good reason for that. It's the fact that, you know, you may think that you're a good trader because you've made money in a bull market. Newsflash, you know, newsflash, not to burst your bubble, but everyone makes money in a bull market, right? Everyone makes money in a bull market. Uh, it's whether you can keep that money that you've made that makes you a good trader or not. And it's whether you can trade in a bear market that makes you a good trader or not. Um, and you know, when the market moves, uh, do you have the logic, uh, you know, that's, that's, you know, speaking louder than your emotions, uh, speaking louder than the greed, speaking louder than the fear, whatever it may be, uh, that's going to allow you to sell. Uh, and this ties back into whether you're educated on the market, whether you understand the cyclical theory, uh, because at the end of the day, if you're using the technique that I just showed you above, which I think is one of the most important techniques uh, to denying uh, your your sense of emotion in the market, which is thinking percentages instead of dollars, uh, you will be able to uh, think that, well, I'm up 200%, uh, you know, yes, it could go higher, but, you know, coming back to what I said before, the higher it goes, the less likely it's going to go higher, Just and the more risk you're taking of it going lower. So 
once you access that part of your brain, instead of just looking at the dollars and think, oh, I'm up $10,000, this is amazing, I don't, let's go get some more, you know, you need to start thinking in percentages instead of dollars, uh, you need to start understanding what kind of trader you are, whether you're a scalp trader, swing trader, long-term investor, uh, you need to understand that manipulation only works because of um, emotions being in human beings, uh, and you need to understand that this market will never require you or very, very rarely require you to act right now, and those are my you know, points for this video, that's what I wanted to bring up. Uh, I think all of those things are very important when it comes to the question, um, you know, will you be able to uh, sell when the market moves, you know, and your emotions, you know, and as I said, tying back into the title, your emotions will try to bankrupt you. Uh, you know, they are your enemy in this market. They are helpful to a certain extent. Um, but, you know, ultimately you need to be accessing the logical part of your brain um, and the statistical part of your brain um, and, you know, you need to be educating yourself. Otherwise, you're never going to succeed in this financial market. Uh, thanks for watching the video, guys. I hope you enjoyed uh, and I'll catch you in the next one. Hello, Wolfpack. Uh, this video is very timely. Uh, it's coming up on a period of time as we are in the market where a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money and, you know, think what you want to think. Look at the market, see it's going up, but I guarantee you most people, maybe not you, right? Maybe not you watching this video, but most people, especially the very new people into the market who don't know how to look at charts, will lose money in cryptocurrency because at the end of the day, you know, when we get to the top uh, in, in December, January, uh, who are we selling to, right? We're selling to people who are buying. Who's buying? People who are uneducated on the market, who are buying at all-time highs, the new, the new people, right? The new players. Uh, and, and this video is kind of directed towards them, right? It's also directed towards people or anyone invests in the market. But, you know, in, in, a, in a timely matter, uh, you know, if you lose money uh, and if you're watching this video, you're probably not really used to it, right? Or you probably don't know how to learn from it. Or maybe you do and maybe you just like watching the content. That's fine too. But I have a few personal points that I've, I've developed uh, over my time uh, trading in financial markets, not only in crypto, but in the stock market as well, right? Um, and... I thought I'd put them into a video and, and kind of show you guys uh, how I personally handle losses and how I recommend people should handle losses. Because I can tell you right now, when you lose, it's not a good feeling, right? All that work you put into uh, learning how to do TA, all that charting, um, all the time you took out of the investment, all the money you risked, you know, it just goes it goes to nothing. But at the end of the day, um, everyone's going to lose. Uh, everyone's going to lose very often, most likely, right? No one wins all the time. Um, you know, not even your favorite crypto Twitter influencer, right? <laughs> um, so... You have to learn to handle losses and you have to learn to learn from losses. And that's what I'm going to be looking at in this video. Let's go to our first point here. First point is you will probably lose very often, right? Except the fact that you will lose, like I just said, right? You will probably lose very often, right? Especially if you're new. Especially if you're new. Because I can tell you why. Because new people in the space are like magnets, right? Uh, people need confirmation, Right, and, and I think especially new people in the market, they need confirmation because why do you think coins pump more once they've been pumping, right? Think of Dogecoin. Why do you think Dogecoin went higher once it went up a little bit, right? Because people want the confirmation that's going to go up. Why do you think Bitcoin, why do you think more people are going to buy Bitcoin at 100K than they were buying at 30K, right? It's not because more people are looking at Bitcoin, right? Everyone knows what Bitcoin is now, right? A lot of people know what Bitcoin is, right? Um, and all the potential buyers know already what Bitcoin is. They just haven't bought it yet. But they will buy at 100K. And they'll buy because they've seen the track record. They've seen that, hey, this thing has gone up so quickly. I need to get in now. But in reality, you know, what they're doing is they're setting themselves up for losses. Uh, and only new people or inexperienced people make the mistake uh, of, of FOMOing in very, very high. Now, everyone FOMOs to a certain extent, but buying Bitcoin at 100K when you could have bought it at 30K is just next level FOMO, right? Wait for the bear market. But new people wouldn't understand that, right? Because they don't know what four-year cycle theory is. And that's not a bad thing, um, you know, in terms of how experienced they are. It's just they're not experienced, right? They don't know it because they haven't educated themselves on it because they don't have time or, or, you know, they don't want to or they just want quick money, right? Um, and new people often get caught up in those scenarios and then they end up losing a lot of money. And that's why, guys, uh, most people in their first cycle, their first cryptocurrency cycle, lose money. And then if they have the confidence, if they have the courage to stick around until the next one, that's when they start making money because they learn their lessons and they have three years to think about what they did wrong, right? So 
Accept the fact that you're probably going to lose, especially if you're new, especially if you're new, very often. Accept the fact that you might not even make money in this bull market, right? Uh, obviously, if you if you listen to, well, I'm going to say if you listen to me, but if you listen to uh, before your cycle theory, listen to the cyclical theory, uh, you should be able to, but um, you know, don't be surprised if you don't, right? Because you're new. It's like riding a bike for the first time. You're going to fall off, right? You're going to fall off before you learn how to do it properly. And and even when you learn how to do it properly, there's going to be the occasional time where you get, you know, you get caught in a pothole and you flip over anyway, right? People lose, even experienced traders, even the best traders in the world still lose very often, right? Um, let's look at the next point here. We've got the next point. Don't chase your losses, all right? When you do lose, this is very important. It goes to anything in life. It goes to, you know, specifically gambling and casinos, right? Anything like that, trading, anything, right? Don't chase your losses. You will get yourself in a much worse situation 99% of the time because now when you're chasing your losses, you're no longer strategically planning a trade, right? Before you enter a trade, even exper even inexperienced people do this to some extent with the limited knowledge they have on the market. Before they enter a trade, they do all the research they can uh, you know, to whatever extent of knowledge they have in the market. Um, before they enter that trade, they enter it and then you know, sometimes it goes south. Uh, and when it goes south, uh, they often become, and this goes to everyone, right? People often become overwhelmed with their emotions uh, of, of sadness, whatever it may be, anger, the fact that it's gone down, blaming other things, blaming manipulation, blaming certain people uh, as to why it's gone down. And then they will, you know, in that same emotional state, uh, in the same sitting, will go and enter another trade. Uh, you know, and, and when people are emotional, when people are in situations like that, they're not going to do all of the research they usually do, and they're definitely not going to have a level-headed, non-biased point of view like they normally do if they're in a calm mood, right? So chasing your losses almost inevitably leads to more losses. And another reason for that is because if you're chasing your losses, you're probably going to double down, right? Uh, so if you lost $100 in a trade, you're probably going to, um, you know, put yourself in a position to lose $200 in the next trade and attempt to make it back because that's the whole thing. People want to make back what they lost, right? Um, so don't get overconfident. Don't chase your losses, you know, and, and this kind of leads on, um, to, to my next point here. And that's understand the market isn't going anywhere. You know, it's not going anywhere. The, the, this market will be here tomorrow. It will be here tomorrow. There will be just as much opportunity tomorrow as there is now, right? For the experienced trader, there will be just as much opportunity tomorrow as there is now. There is always scenarios in which experienced traders can trade profitably, right? If you're new to crypto, if you're inexperienced in TA, trading in a bull market is the best idea because the whole trend is upwards. All you need to do is invest with a trend, right? But experienced traders know that, you know, no matter what the trend is, up or down sideways, they can still make money. They can still profit, right? Because they know the charts that well. But, you know, even if you're new, even if you're new, uh, in order to avoid that emotional risk, right, of chasing your losses, you know, if you lose, if you're feeling emotional, if you're feeling angry, sad, whatever it may be, take a step away. And I know that's hard to do. It's hard to do. But you need to remind yourself that, uh, you know, you're not actually benefiting yourself in the long run if you're chasing losses because you're having a net negative gain, right? Um, you know, 90% you, you, of the time, as I said, and, and you can probably attest to this because you've probably done it, right? People have done it. I've done it. Everyone's done it, right? Everyone's tried to chase their losses at some point in life, you know, whether it be in crypto, whether it be in anything. Um, and, and how many times has that gone well, right? Very rarely, very rarely. Um, so, you know, understand this market isn't going anywhere. Come back tomorrow. Come back in two hours. Go for a walk. Come back after that. You know, there's still going to be coins in similar positions as the coins you want to trade. Yes, you might miss a breakout. Yes, you might miss a little thing. But at the end of the day, there's, there's thousands of old coins in this market, right? Thousands. There's going to be a coin out there that's ripe for a trade at any given moment. You just have to find it, right? You just have to search the market for it. So take a break. Come back. It's not going anywhere. The opportunity is still going to be here tomorrow. Um, take responsibility for the loss. All right, I'll, oh, I accidentally revealed that last point. I'll cover it back up. <laughs> Take responsibility for the loss, right? Take personal responsibility. Um, this is very important. Don't have that victim mentality. I've spoken about a victim mentality uh, before in a previous video on, on my market mindset series, but having a victim mentality is possibly one of the worst things you could do, not only in trading, but in general life. Because when you have a victim mentality, you're not taking personal responsibility. And when you don't take personal responsibility, well, you know, as it, as it means, right, as the word means, not taking personal responsibility, you're not holding yourself accountable for the loss. And if you don't hold yourself accountable for the loss, you will never learn from a loss because you don't think the loss is your fault, right? If you're driving a car and someone rams into you, right, when you were doing nothing wrong, 
you're not going to take personal responsibility for that car crash, and hence you're not going to learn from it. But if you make a bad trade and you lose money, you made that trade. You should take personal responsibility. It doesn't matter, you know, what happened. It doesn't matter if the market was manipulated and the whole market crashed 30% in two seconds. Where was your stop loss? Where was your stop loss? That's still your fault. You know, it doesn't matter if any black swan event, if, if you know, say, I don't know, uh, the USA went to war with China in the middle of your trade and the whole market collapsed. You know, where was your stop loss? You should have had a stop loss. There's always something that is your fault, right? If you lose money, it is your fault. It is a very, very, very rare occurrence where you lose a trade and it is not your fault, right? I'm saying that right now, very rare. There is always something you can do to protect yourself. And in the occurrence that there isn't, right, in the very rare case where it actually isn't your fault and it actually was out of your control, well, um, you know, what can you say? You probably should still take personal responsibility because, you know, it's a good mindset to be in. It's a good mindset to be in that everything that happens uh, is your fault because then the wins are your fault as well, right? So when you make money, that's your personal responsibility for that. When Once you start... Uh, distancing, distancing yourself from responsibility, whether it is logical or not, you start uh, stop. You know, you start to stop learning from your wins and stop learning from your losses, and you start to stop progressing. And that's the most important part. You have to be constantly progressing. And in order to progress, you need to take responsibility. Whether it was actually your fault or not, you need to take responsibility. Right? F forget about logic. Sounds weird to say, but forget about logic. This is about mindset. Right, if you need to be in, you know, you need to be in a victim mindset, right? You know, you need to be in a mindset in which you're willing to to take what you're given. You need to be in a mindset in which you're willing to reap the rewards of what you do, positive or negative, no matter whose fault it is, right? As I said, uh, and, and this could be a point in itself, right? This could be a point in itself, but I said it before. Uh, one of the most important things you should be doing if you're trading is having stop losses, right? Yes. The market might flash crash and you might get stopped out. But, you know, at the end of the day, if the market flash crashes uh, and it doesn't recover, uh, well, then you've lost 80% of your money, right? So stop losses are always important in most scenarios. Most scenarios, not always, right? I understand that if you're holding Bitcoin for the long term or whatever, uh, you don't really want to have a stop loss because then you'll get stopped out and you'll lose your whole bag, right? It's not the ideal situation in every scenario, but for swing trading and scalp trading, I highly recommend having stop losses. Uh, it will, uh, you know, divert uh, those bad situations um, and, and they won't happen to you as much. And then you won't have to face this uh, moral dilemma of whether, you know, I should take responsibility for that loss or not. Um, you should always be taking responsibility for what happens, no matter what it is, no matter how much of your fault it is, always take responsibility. It's a good mindset to be in. Um, let's head over to the last point here. Write down what you did wrong. There is so many scientific studies, so many psychological, you know, studies, psychological, you know, experiments, whatever it may be, that says that writing down, you know, even when it goes back to your schooling life, right? What did your teachers say to you? Uh, they said, take notes, right? Take notes, because if you take notes, even the act of writing something down, even if you never look at those notes again, you will remember it, right? It's the same thing with this, same thing with trading, right? If you do something wrong, and, and you've never experienced that wrong thing before, write it down, write it down. And what this would do, and have it on a piece of paper, right by your computer, right by wherever you're trading from, and and add to it every time you do something wrong. Every time a trade fails, say, for example, um, you know you entered, you entered a trade, you didn't have stop loss, it dropped, and you had to sell dramatically lower than you would have liked to, right, overnight. You write that down, uh, a couple months go by, it happens again. You write it down again. You look above and you see, wow, this has happened before. Why haven't I learned from this? Right? The act of writing it down is so crucial because you're not going to forget the things you need to improve on. If you write something down, uh, you're always going to have it right there. I need to improve in that. I need to fix that for next time. When you're making the next trade, when you're setting up the next trade, you're going to be sure to put that stop loss there because making the same mistake over and over and over again is literally the definition of insanity. Right? So... Those are my points, right? I got five pretty interesting points there. Could probably add more to it, but these are the five I've chosen in the short period of time I made to, uh, you know, put together this video. Um, there's always opportunities for me to just make more videos on market mindset in the future, so I'm not too stressed about that. Um, and I will continue this series because, you know, this series doesn't get a lot of views. I don't know why. It just doesn't. People don't like it. It's not flashy enough, I guess. Um, but I certainly think it's probably the most important thing I do on YouTube because mindset is exponentially more important than short-term price action, right? Always will be, always has been. Thanks for watching, guys. Hope you enjoyed. Catch you in the next one. Hello, Wolfpack. I want to get into a more 
uh, psychological elephant element uh, today in market mindset. I know you know market mindset is typically a psychological series uh, where I go over some strategies you can use for your own mental state to improve your trading. Uh, but I want to actually talk about something a little bit different, and that is why is cryptocurrency uh, psychological unique? All right, psychologically unique. Right. So I've been looking at a lot of things recently. Um, Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins is a, uh, motiv- I guess you could say he's a motivational speaker, even though that's a pretty cringy word to use, but he's a public speaker in the US uh, who, who reached pretty much peak popularity uh, in the early 2000s, I, was, I would assume, but he was, he, he's been around for a while, right? He's 60 years old, he's been speaking for a long time. Um, and, he, and he really outlines some, some great points, right? And one of those points is uh, the six fundamental human needs, right? So six distinctive things uh, that that humans kind of kind of need or strive for, and in any given event, any given person, any given thing, uh, if if that event, if that thing, so in this case, cryptocurrency meets three of those fundamental needs, uh, then it's going to be fulfilling for that person. Uh, and it's whole base, it's all based around the premise that uh, success without fulfillment is failure, right? And I, I agree with that. Think about that for a second. Success without fulfillment is failure. Um, 100% agree, right? Because success, whether it be monetary, whether it be uh, successful in your family, whether it be whatever, if you're not fulfilled, uh, you're you're, you're going to be a failure. And, and and I think that, you know, if you think of, uh, he used an example, Robin Williams, right? The famous actor in America um, who, who killed himself, right? Hung himself. Um, you think about what he did, right? Um, so he used examples that, you know, he, he said he wanted to make movies. He made movies. He said he wanted to win, uh, an Oscar for comedies. He, he won the Oscar. He said he wanted to win an Oscar for serious acting, right? No joking. He won that. He said he wanted to build a successful family. He won that. He said he wanted to build a successful charity. He did that. He did everything in his life that, that he put out, um, and set out to do, but he still ended up killing himself. And, you know, and I think that's a great example. You know, he, he tried to make, uh, everyone happy but himself, right? He tried to meet everyone else's fundamental six human needs, uh, but he didn't meet his own, right? So there wasn't fulfillment in his life and hence his life wasn't satisfying, right? And yes, he was very successful, right? In all aspects of his life, very successful person, but he wasn't fulfilled, right? And and this is why I want to talk about this. And this is why I want to talk about cryptocurrency because I was thinking about cryptocurrency. I was thinking about my investing experience and this might be personalized to me. I don't think it is. Right, but it might be personalized to me. And I was thinking about the six fundamental human needs that I'll go over in a second. And I was like, wow, you know, this is this is really, um, really close to what we have going on in the cryptocurrency space. And and we'll get into it right now, right? So we have the first fundamental human need, which is certainty. All right. Oh, and I just revealed them all there. I hope you didn't see that. Let's just scroll this down a little bit. Certainty, right? Um, so assurance that you can avoid pain and gain pleasure. Um, how does this relate to cryptocurrency? Well, actually, I'll go over that in a second, right? So certainty as our first one, assurance that you can gain, gain pain, avoid pain and gain pleasure, All right? Our second fundamental human need, uncertainty and variety, right? Contradicting the last one, um, the need for unknown change, new stimulation, right? So this, this is a great example. So, you know, for example, you can be seeking certainty and uncertainty at the same time. Uh, remember when Blockbuster was around or, you know, movie renting stores, uh, you know, how many people would have gone to a, a, a renting store, a movie renting store and rented the same movie twice, right? A lot of people have done that. Why? Because why would you watch a movie twice? Even, even without that on Netflix, why would you watch the same movie you've already watched, right? Because you're certain it's going to be good and maybe something you didn't notice last time will happen this time. Or, you know, you're certain it's going to be good because you've seen it before, but you can't really remember the story that well and you want to watch it again because you remember the feeling, you don't remember the actual specifics, right? So uncertainty and certainty can definitely play out at the same time. As for another one, significance, right? Significance, so feeling unique, feeling important, feeling special, feeling needed. Everyone wants to feel significant. You know, why why do people dress up you know, yeah, to go to, say, for example, I don't know if a lot of my American viewers would have prom, right? <laughs> I have, you know, formals in the, in Australia, right? Why would people dress up to that? Because they want to feel special. They want to feel beautiful, unique. They want to stand out. You know, why do people wear makeup? Same thing. Why do people buy shoes? You know, same thing. Why don't you just go to Target and buy some $5 shoes? Why would you buy $100 shoes? Because you want to feel special. You want to feel some unique. You want to feel important, not only for others, but for yourself. So it definitely makes sense there. Um, connection and love, 
right? A strong feeling of closeness or union with someone or something. Now, this doesn't have to be a romantic relationship, although most people would probably strive for that. Uh, it could just be, um, you know, friendships, really intense friendships with, with friends, family. Uh, everyone, everyone, you know, whether you have it or not, everyone wants that. And everyone wants that closeness, uh, that feeling of, of, of union with someone. Because once you have that union, uh, you know, if something happens to you, you know, say, for example, you, you win a million dollars, you win the lottery, you're gonna, you can only celebrate with yourself so much, right, before the, the, um, the rule of familiar, familiarity kicks in, right, so there's often things that happen in people's lives where they work for it for 5, 10, 15 years, and once they finally get it, they're very excited about it for like three days, but then it becomes familiar, right, and how do they extend the joy? They tell other people about it, so the, the party keeps running, Right, so that's what connection and love is all about. It's about keeping the party running, keeping the fun things in your life kind of extending over and over again, and and also having someone uh, to to talk to and you know all that all that good stuff. But connection and love is number four. Um, growth, right, and expansion of capacity, capability, uh, capability, and understanding. And and this is a great this is a great point, right? Number five. And I'll I'll tie all of this back into cryptocurrency. Don't worry. But this is a great point. Number five. Growth. All right. You know there's there's a really good there's a really good uh philosophy in in the business world you know as a, as a small business owner myself you know i really do do agree with it you know if you're not growing uh you're dying right if you're not growing you're 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 attracting you're dying whatever you want to say and the same thing with a business right if a business isn't growing it's dying right if i for example uh on youtube i go ahead and i just post the same content over and over and over and over again right and, you know, to an extent, I kind of have to do that, right? Because I'm a, I'm a cryptocurrency channel, right? I have to look at the charts. That's But that's not what I'm saying. If I do the same thing all the time, use the same indicators, same fractals all over and over and over again, eventually people are going to get sick of it and I'm not going to be growing anymore, right? Yes, I'm still going to be putting the work in, but I'm not growing. There's no strategic innovation. There's no new things coming to the channel, right? That's why I'm starting a, a, a cryptocurrency merch store, right? a clothing store, because there needs to be strategic innovation to keep people interested. If you're not growing, you're retracing. If you're not growing, eventually your business is going to fail. Why do you think Apple and Samsung and all those companies, right, they release new phones every year, right? Do you think they used to do that back 10 years ago? No, this market has become way more competitive, right? Uh, I think there was, there was uh, I can't remember the statistic exactly, but I think back in the, the early 2000s, uh, strategic innovation in the mobile phone industry only needed to take place once every three years. So once every three years, they would need to make a change to their phones, you know, release a new phone, do something interesting, you know, bring Siri or something, you know, new new apps, you know, once every three years. Now, as you know, the competition in the market has, has been driven to the upside, um, every six months, strategic innovation is required. And you think about that every six months, and you can definitely think about this in your personal life, you know, Apple is releasing a new phone. Apple's releasing new colors, new, like, you know, sub phone. You have the iPhone 6, iPhone 6S, you know, new things like that every six months because people need to be kept interested. Um, and, and that's that growth. And if, if Apple didn't do that, they would fall behind, right? So without growth, you're dying, right? So you need growth, not even in a business perspective, in your personal life. You need to be constantly improving yourself or you're going to fall into a, a cycle of unfulfillment. And as I said, unfulfillment is is one of the most deadly things you can you can face in your life. Um, so that's number five. And number six, our last one here is contribution, right? Um, contribution, a sense of service, on focusing on helping, giving support to others, makes perfect sense, right? Um, there's there's been multiple psychological studies that have been done that I can't name because I'm not. <laughs> it's not really the point of this video, but but you know, essentially, multiple studies have been done that you know helping other people gives someone more pl pleasure, more dopamine than actually helping themselves, right? So it comes from a very simple perspective. It doesn't even need to be directly giving food to someone, you know, for a, to a homeless person, more about giving them a dollar or something. It can be in terms of starting a charity. It can be in terms of doing volunteering. It can be anything like that. Or even even working in an area you think might be beneficial. Say, for example, um, you know, back when, oh, you know, I mean, this is just off the top of my head, but, uh, you know, people will try to make healthy food, you know, um, when they realize that, hey, this, this stuff people are eating is unhealthy, right? And that's why all these health sh stores have come up. You know, that can be that can be a contribution to your to your community because instead of people buying McDonald's, they're going to go buy, you know, a salad sandwich or something. You know, it's, it's, it's contributing uh, to the health of your community. So it doesn't have to be directly charity. It could be anything to do with business or anything like that. But, 
you know, the point is people need to feel like they're doing something beneficial uh, to the earth, you know, if they're normal people. Um, and, you know, even, even if they're not doing something beneficial, as long as it's justified as beneficial in their mind, as long as they think they're contributing, even if they're definitely not, um, you know, for example, the gambling industry, right? Casino bosses, uh, you can pretty safely say they're not contributing to much, right? They're pretty much uh, very, very immoral people um, who, are, who are running, you know, systems rigged to take people's money. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, they could justify that. That they could say that, you know, oh, we're, I'm just providing a place in which people can have fun, you know, and they are right to an extent, but I think the good outweighs the bad in most situations. But the point of the matter is, as long as you feel like, as long as you convince yourself that you're contributing, uh, that you're satisfying that, that uh, one of those six fundamental needs, right? So why do I want to speak about cryptocurrency in regards to this? Well, I wanted to speak about cryptocurrency because usually, you know, some events, uh, you know, and things that happen in your life, you can name anything in your life right now, take it off the top of your head, anything. Uh, and, and most of the time, the vast majority of the time, that thing or that person would only fulfill, um, you know, one, two, three, or maybe four of those fundamental human needs. And, you know, again, Tony Robbins says that you need three of these fundamental human needs to be met in regards to something or someone uh, for them to be fulfilling or for it to be fulfilling, right? So the reason why I want to talk about cryptocurrency is because for me personally, and I think a lot of people would feel the same way about this, you know, it seems as though um, six of them are met, all six of them, right? And that's just so unique, right? I think that's why we have such a strong community here in the cryptocurrency space, because I was thinking about it, and I, I, don't, I can't think of any community, you know, through crypto Twitter, through crypto YouTube, that is, that is more connected on a daily basis. And yes, that could be due to the fact that they need to be connected in order to survive in the market, but... You know, there's not many communities that I see uh, that do this like the cryptocurrency community and specifically within, you know, certain coins, you know, you got a Digibyte community on Telegram, Nano community on Telegram. They're talking to each other every single day about how their coin's going to change the world. You know, you know, you go B B Bitcoin Twitter, you know, I know it's full of Bitcoin maximalists and yeah, it's a bunch of memes most of the time, but at the end of the day, there's, there's, there's still a fundamental, um, you know, overlay that you know guys we're actually changing the world by supporting this you know and yes most of the people that are make money but they're still supporting something that that is very much contributing to, to society so let's go go through the needs and i'll, I'll understand I'll, I'll tell you why so certainty right and certainty i know you can you can say that well certainty is not in the cryptocurrency market we're not even sure it's going on it could crash 30 percent tomorrow that's not what i mean i mean the certainty in the fact that uh, the, the global financial current monetary policy is unsustainable. And the certainty in the fact that something needs to replace that, right? And that's where the certainty comes from. And even on another level, you know, if you're a very, very experienced trader, you could have certainty. You know, you could have certainty in what's going to happen next. Uh, due to the cyclical theory, you could have certainty in what's going to happen next. You could have certainty that we're going to face regulation. You could have certainty that, you know, countries are going to adopt Bitcoin. And that, that definitely applies to cryptocurrency. Uncertainty and variety, Right? Do I even need to talk about this uncertainty? What if I, what if I wake up tomorrow and all my coins are gone? What if I wake up tomorrow and, and my wallet's empty? What if I wake up tomorrow and the market's down thirty percent? Variety, thousands of different cryptocurrency coins with thousands of different uh, needs. So that's two. That's two fundamental human needs. Significance, right? Feeling unique, important, special, or needed. Right? Why do you think people are involved in this cryptocurrency space? Right, because they want to make money. That's one part of it. That's one part of it. They want to make money, and making money in itself is feeling special, right? Because not many people have a dramatic amount of money, and people in cryptocurrency want to make a life-changing amount of money. So it's 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 a desire to feel significant, the desire to feel unique, different to other people in the sense that you have this wealth, right? There's also the side of it that you want to feel different from people who who you know, for example, are holding all of their money in fiat currency, right? You want to feel unique in the sense that hey. I'm holding something superior that is that is very unknown. It's kind of unknown at the moment. It won't be in the future, but is is very low key. Not many people know it or understand it. I'm holding that. I'm significant. You know, I'm doing something different to other people. And and you know, and to say that people don't feel like that, I think is is lying. You know, you know, I think most cryptocurrency investors, um, and excuse me if I'm speaking for you, do have, you know, I don't want to say a superiority complex, but they do have. Um, a deep 
belief that what they are doing, what they are holding, why they're buying Bitcoin is more morally just than um, you know other, other financial traders, for such as stock market traders. So I think there's, you know, since there is a meaning behind it, whereas the stock market, it's just basically make money. Cryptocurrency, it's yeah, make money, but also you're contributing to something that could potentially bring back the free world, All right? So connection and love, you know, obviously you can say love isn't a thing, but connection, I can definitely feel a connection. Cryptocurrency community, building my own community to the wolf pack, you know, and obviously we don't know each other personally, but there is a connection there. We're both interested in, you know, and me speaking directly to you right now, we're both interested in similar coins potentially. Uh, you're part of my Telegram group. I've probably spoken to you in the Telegram group. I probably, you know, maybe even potentially done business with you in the past. There is a connection there between, between uh, I guess you could say owner and customer to a certain extent, but I don't like to think of it like that, right? Because I'm not, I'm not making you pay for anything. This is completely free. Um, I like to think of it between, uh, you know, community leader and community member, you know, the wolf and the wolf pack. Um, and there is a connection there and no doubt that connection will grow over time. Um, as, you know, some of my supporters, you know, I, I have been here since day one as well, which I know say, I know day one wasn't very long ago for the wolf, wolves of crypto, but six months ago, roughly. But, you know, the point of the matter is, is, you know, some of those people might still be there uh, in a few years when, you know, this channel potentially grows up, you know, grows up and reaches 100,000 followers, 100,000, whatever it may be. Um, and there's definitely a connection there between uh, the community. So, and not even on a business level, but also on a, a crypto Twitter level. And why do you think people go to these conferences, you know, Bitcoin conferences in Dubai, in Miami, because they're connected to these people. They have the same interests, right? They have the same beliefs. Growth, you know, and obviously a very simple one. Growth, I could list it out very easily right now for me personally. Well, growth in the sense that I'm constantly developing my technical analysis and fundamental analysis, researching skills, right? Um, and in order for me to, to continue profiting the market, I need to be constantly staying up to date with the new indicators that are coming out, the new trends, new charting patterns. And, you know, I'm not a 100% cryptocurrency wizard, guys. You know, I, I'd say I'm very, very experienced, but I don't know every single indicator. You know, you could throw 100 indicators at me and I'd probably know 80 of them. You know, I don't know every single one. And I can't say that, you know, I use every single one and every score analysis I do. So there's always room for improvement, even in the best traders. And I'm not the best trader. I'm just saying even in the best traders, even, even in the best possible trader that ever existed, there's always room for improvement. No one knows every single tiny thing about technical analysis or about, you know, researching skills for finding good projects as well. There's always room for improvement, always room for growth. And on a business level, once again, you know, as I said before, I need to be growing this business, otherwise it's going to be dying. Uh, and, and the same thing, and even the same thing for specific projects and teams of coins. If you have a coin that you're holding, I'm sure many people would go through this before. You know, if you have a coin that you're holding uh, and they're doing very, very well uh, for months and months and months, and then one day you notice that, hey, these guys haven't released an update or a new thing to the network or anything for three months. You know, there's a lack of growth. And yes, the coin still remains, the fundamentals are still the same, but there's no progression. When there's no progression, people get bored and they and they send their money other, way, other places. It's like when Bitcoin tops out and heads sideways, you know, there's no progression in the price. People get bored, bored so they sell their Bitcoin right, and put their money into old coins that are still moving. You know, it's all about growth in this market. And I think that, ma that matches that fundamental human need as well. So that's five, contribution. Obviously, and I spoke about this before, I'm pretty sure I spoke about this before, before but contribution, a sense of service, you know, current government monetary, sorry, the current government monetary policy is unsustainable. I am contributing to something that is going to give people back their freedom, that is going to stop people being robbed from inflation. There is a sense of that contribution that you're doing, you know, that you are supporting in cryptocurrency, even if you're not here for the contribution aspect, even if you're here for the money, you're still contributing, right? You're still an early adopter. And I think that sense of contribution is, is with most people, you know, um, so that's six, right? And and I, I was thinking about that before, and I, I'm sure there's other things you could, you could list six for, and I know that this is kind of personalized to me, but, you know, Tony Robbins said, and, and, you know, a lot of people who did this study said that you have to meet three of those human needs for anything or anyone to be fulfilling, and cryptocurrency meets all six of them, and I think that's why it has this level of attraction uh, to people. You know, people seem to, you know, for example, me, you know, I was into stocks before I was into cryptocurrency, you know, I try to trade stocks sometimes. It is so boring. And you can say, you can say that like, yeah, that's because of the less returns. It's not about the returns. It's not about the returns at all. It's about the fact that there's just no, there's nothing there. It's just, it's just charts to make money. There's no greater meaning to it. And I think the cryptocurrency really offers that greater meaning. You know, 
giving freedom back to the people. And it sounds really cringe to say, but it, it's true. It offers a greater meaning, something bigger than yourself or your personal finances. And I think that's what cryptocurrency offers. And I think, as I said, that's why uh, this, this space is so strong and so attractive and so appealing to people. And when you come here, you can't get away from it. Even if you lose money, even if you lose your life savings, you're still coming back. You know, and it sounds a bit addictive and it is addictive, right? But I think that's what makes it very fulfilling, right? Because when you do succeed in this space, you feel fulfilled because not only have you, have you helped yourself, but you've also gained knowledge on something that's going to potentially be life-changing to everyone on the planet, you know? And that's just great to see. I, I wanted to bring that to your attention. Uh, I don't really have any, much more to say about it, but you know, I, f I found it very interesting. And I thought, why not make a video on it? So uh, let me know what you think. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll catch you in the next one. Hello, Wolfpack. Let's take a look uh, and let's take a dive into gambler's fallacy in the cryptocurrency market of this episode of Market Mindset very briefly here because gambler's fallacy is a serious thing. It's a serious problem. And for those of you who don't know, there have been multiple studies that have come out, um, but I'm not going to source down below because I don't really uh, feel the need to do that. Uh, but you can go and find them for sure. Uh, I've read them before that, you know, people who have had gambling addictions in the past are very, very likely to get into, get involved in financial markets. Uh, and, and crypto markets, you know, are, is a financial market. And, you know, some would say it's a more thrilling version of the stock market. So people who have had gambling problems in the past or gamblers, even if they haven't had a problem, uh, you know, would be more enticed uh, to actually invest in the cryptocurrency market than a regular human being. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I feel like a lot of people in the cryptocurrency market have this gambling mindset. Um, you know, not only on a linear level, not only with the, you know, I want 10x returns, you know, easy 10x returns, not only the, the greed that comes with it, but also specifically, and what I think is the most important problem, the gambler's fallacy, uh, you know, in, in conjunction or in, yeah, yeah, in conjunction with, with the lack of education in the market. And so a gambler's fallacy or, or the gambler's fallacy is basically for example, say I flip a coin 10 times, the most likely result, and you know, speaking of statistics, is it lands on heads five times and it lands on tails five times. Now, obviously that doesn't really happen most of the time, right? But it is a 50-50 uh, for the most part chance, right? 50-50 chance. Uh, a, roulette, a roulette wheel, right? Same thing, 50-50 chance is going to land on uh, red or green. If you take away the uh, red or, sorry, red or black. If you take away the house edge, red or black, right? So, things like that that are 50 50 chances now what the gambler's fallacy is is if i flip the coin five times and it lands on heads five times uh you know you might be more likely to think all right this guy it's this time it's got to land on tails right it's got to land on tails because it's landed on heads five times so surely it has to break the streak and, and tails must be more likely now right because he can't land on heads six times that would be impossible that's gambler's fallacy when in reality it can very well land on you know heads again because it is an independent event. Every single flip is an independent event, uh, and the problem with the gambler mindset and, and gambler's fallacy is you start to uh, get mixed up and think that um, those events are dependent rather than independent. You think that the last flip has an influence on the next flip, and that's why people who try to make strategies, for example, about roulette in a casino, who who take into account that. If it's landed on red three times, it has to land on black, right? So put more money on black, bet on black. Uh, that doesn't make sense, right? You're, you're still betting, it's still got the same odds to land on. Even if it lands on red a hundred times, it's still got the same odds to land on red again, right? So that's the gambler's fallacy. And how this applies to the cryptocurrency market is in trading uh, when people are making trades, okay? And and I see people doing this a lot. I'm just not just pulling this you know, out of, out of thin air here. This is a very common thing. What people will do, and it kind of goes in line with revenge trading as well. What people do is they'll lose, say, three trades in a row, in a row, or they'll win three trades in a row, and then they'll think, "Yeah, my my luck's gonna run out soon, right? My luck's gonna run out soon. I'm gonna put more money on this one. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna put less money on this one because my luck's gonna run out soon. I've run three in a row. I have to lose one eventually, right? When in reality, it's an independent event." Right? They're not treating it as an independent event. Another example would be just flipping it around. I've lost five trades in a row. So now I'm increasing my position, right? I'm increasing my trade site. Instead of trading with $1,000, I'm putting $10,000 per trade because my luck has to come back, right? I've lost four in a row. I have to win soon, right? I have to make money soon. doesn't make sense, right? Every trade is independent from each other. Uh, the market doesn't care 
about what's happened in the past, right? The market doesn't care about what specific trades you made. It's not going to, you know, just magically favor you on the next one, right? And it's the same thing with coin flipping, same thing with roulette wheel, right? Um, and the reason I wanted to bring this up is because obviously a lot of people make this mistake uh, and, you know, it could go back into, as I said before, revenge trading. Uh, and revenge trading is a very similar thing. Revenge trading is, you know, kind of like the gambler's fallacy where it's, you know, I've lost so much money today, all right, so now I need to make it all back. I'm going to bet much, much, much bigger so I can make it all back, you know, and that's going to get you in some serious trouble because every single trade is an independent event. Every single trade has its own, you know, own, you know, individual statistic, individual probability of playing out to the upside and to the downside. So treating it as if it's one conjoined thing is very logical. So that's what I wanted to bring to you guys today. Uh, and how do how do you conquer gambler's fallacy? How do you get out of this mindset of revenge trading or gambler's fallacy? What you need to do, first of all, is literally just understand it. Understand what you're doing is is illogical. It doesn't make sense, right? Would you do that in a casino? Right? Some of you probably would. I mean, you know, someone's going to have a strategy on roulette somehow. But the point is, it's not going to make you more likely to profit on the next trade. Okay. Um, so, so there's two kind of aspects of this. There's gambler's fallacy, which is, you know, my luck's going to come back soon. I have to bet more here. And then there's revenge trading, which is, you know, I'm angry. I have to bet more here. I'm sad. I have to bet more here. Um, both of which are completely illogical and both of which kind of play into the same kind of mindset, right? Um, so understand it. Next time you try to do it, and I'm not saying some, you know, all of you guys do this, but now, oh, sorry, I just zoomed in dramatically there. Let me zoom back out quickly. Oh, and I can't. Okay, but that is, I don't, that's irrelevant right now. Next time you try to do it, next time you, you know, stop yourself, understand what's been said here today. Understand gambler's fallacy. Understand that you're falling into a trap that, you know, dumb money falls into. You know, you, you, if you think about the big money, if you speak about the smart, smart money, big investors with lots and lots of money who've been investing for years and years, very experienced, they would not fall into this trap, right? So what you need to be doing, just like, for example, in a basketball, you know, if you want to be a basketball player, you need to copy the big guys, copy the big players, you know, learn from the professionals, same thing with trading. If the professionals don't revenge trade, if the professionals don't fall victim to gambler's fallacy, you should not, right? And you should stop yourself from doing that. Uh, in order to become a decent trader. Thanks for watching, guys. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll catch you in the next one.